a service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. And now, let's resume the life of Mary Southern. There is nothing more vicious than an enemy who attempts to gain his end by appealing to the sympathetic human emotions of his victim. Mary Southern herself wants to tell you how her enemies have applied these deadly tactics to her and to her husband, Max. Soon after my husband, Max, became involved in opening a gambling house here in Sanders, I learned that he had two reasons for doing it. First, he wanted to be sure that the entire gambling syndicate was rounded up, and therefore he appeared to work with them rather than against them. Second, a more personal reason, Max wanted me to believe that he wasn't good enough for me and that I'd be happier married to someone else. During all this, Danny and Phyllis Stratford were expecting the stork. The baby came at the peak of the excitement, and Phyllis may be an invalid for life. Danny blamed Max for the whole thing, even though Dr. Benson told him that the excitement had little to do with it. Now, the Reverend Blaine, Dr. John, and Danny's father, Daddy Stratford, feel they can get Max a trial postponement. But Danny's too bitter toward Max, and has so far refused to come over to our side. Mr. Gerald Proust, who's always been jealous of Je- uh, Max and me, offered to send Phyllis, Danny's wife, to a sanitarium in Switzerland where she might be cured if Danny promised not to tell the whole story about Max. Mr. Proust wants Max behind bars so that he can take over Sanders. What can I say to Danny? His young wife, an invalid, perhaps for life, with a chance, her only chance, to be cured. Yesterday I said just one thing to Danny, something I believe in my own heart that happiness can't be bought with a betrayer's money. That Judas had found that out some 2,000 years ago. If Danny tells only half the truth about Max, my life's ruined. If he tells it all, his young wife may never be cured. My enemies have struck at our hearts. Frankly, I'm bewildered. It was a few seconds after Mary made a dramatic appeal to Danny. There they stand, outside Phyllis's room at the clinic. Danny, silent, bitter, torn with conflicting emotions of right and his love for Phyllis. Mary, frightened with herself, to leave Danny's decision to himself. Danny, it's up to you to decide. I can't tell you to help us free Max. It's Max's freedom against Phyllis' cure. Max means as much to me as I know Phyllis means to you. You don't even have to lie on the witness stand for either of us. If you accept Mr. Proust's offer, you don't tell the whole story. If you want to help Max, you'll tell everything you know. Is that all you've got to say, Mary? Yes, Dad. Maybe I've... Maybe I've said too much. I, I don't know. Come on, you better go back to Phyllis. She thinks I started to faint, so don't tell her differently. Tell her I went home. Okay, Mary. Danny, hmm? anything you decide, we'll still love you. Remember that, Danny. Okay, Mary. Thanks. Bye, Danny. Mary. Huh? Oh, she's all right. She took a drink of water. Danny, hmm? while you were outside, I, I've been thinking how wonderful everything's going to be. Huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be wonderful. I'm going to be well again. We've got a new little baby. I'm going to be everything in the world to you, Danny, and then some. Oh, gee, Danny. Just think if... Well, if, if I couldn't ever be cured, wouldn't that be terrible? I wouldn't be able to walk or, or do any housework. Why, I wouldn't be worth a dime, would I? Oh, oh, sure you would. No, I wouldn't, Danny. 
And I couldn't keep you tied down to me. Not if I was, well, like you said I am right now. Oh, but it's all so wonderful, Danny. And I'm so happy. I oh, come here. Sit on the bed. <laughs> but be careful. Easy. What? Nothing. I, I just want you to sit by me. While you were talking to Mary, I, I had a lot of wonderful thoughts. What else did you think of? Well, by the time I'm cured and come back from Switzerland, Max will be out of his trouble and, and we can start life all over. All of us. Mary and Max and Daddy and, and our two babies. Does... Does Max getting out of this trouble, does it... Does it mean so much to you? Well, of course. Max is my brother. I know, but... Oh, but look what he's done to everybody. Look what a heel he's been. Oh, Danny, Max is good. He's sweet. You know he is. We love him. You know we do. Oh, he's been so wonderful to us. He's done so much for you and for me. Oh, look when Dad and Mother left him. All alone with a Sanders interest to handle himself. With a pack of debt. He saved the town from going under. Think how often he's helped you out of scrape. And even if he hadn't done a thing for us, Danny, Max is still my brother. I love him. And so do you. Oh, but I... Oh, I that's can't. a funny thing, Danny. But us Sanders have a habit of getting into strange situations. <laughs> Just look at Max and me right now. Sister and brother. We're... Well, we're both caught in a trap. Huh? Well, I... I don't get that. Max is in jail. Wasn't his fault, but he's there. I'm here in the clinic. I'm like in a jail, too. Can't walk. I'm caught, too. We're both caught in a trap. Isn't that funny? <laughs> yeah. It is funny, isn't it? But the wonderful part about it, Danny, I'm going to be let out of my jail just because of you. Max is going to be let out of his because I oh, love the wonderful thing, Danny. It can cure more things and, and do more things than, than the most powerful machines in the world. It was your love that's going to make me walk again. And it's going to be Mary's love. Our love that it's going to make Max all right and get out of jail. Danny, don't cry. I can't help it, Philly. No. No, I don't guess you can, Dan. I was so happy about everything that, that I could cry, too. Max, I couldn't fight with Danny. I did tell him that I thought happiness couldn't be bought. I had to tell him that, Max. Well, maybe it can, and then maybe it can't, Mary. It can't, Max. Yeah, but, but I'm Phyllis's brother. Well, I'd go to prison for life to make her walk again. Of course you would, Max. Yeah, but I wouldn't have a chance to get a postponement. Not without Danny being on our side. Well, I think maybe we'd just better count him out. Not yet. He may come with us. Well, why should he, Mary? He's got a chance to cure Phyllis. Why should he try to free a mug like me when he can make his wife well again? Besides, she's my sis, Mary. And... I know, I know, Max, but... But you're my husband. I've got to be selfish about you just as Danny must be selfish about Phyllis. And who's that coming in? Huh? Oh, oh, I think it's John. Hello, Mary. Didn't know you were here. Hello, John. Ah, hi, Pillroller. Hello, Woodland. How's the jail business? Oh, perfect. Perfect. And just a little refinement. Oh, confining, Max. Okay, thanks. Sure. Mary, did you tell Max about the proofs from Danny? Yeah, yeah, she told me now. I just came from Danny and Phyllis. Say anything to him? No, nothing much. I couldn't, John. It's too much of a decision for Danny to make. It's all up to him. I wonder if the kid realizes it. I... I tried to point that out to him. Say, so, Doc, is, is this joint in Sweden okay? It's Switzerland, Max, not Sweden. Oh, yeah, sure. Up in the Alps. Well, uh, is it the McCoy? I mean, can Sis really get in shape up there? Well, they specialize in cases like hers. You should have a good chance to be cured. Climate helps a lot, too. Well, Toots, there's your answer. It's not my answer, Max. It's, it's Danny's. 
And there's Danny. There's a cure for both of you. A cure for Phyllis, a cure for you. You can't walk outside any more than Phyllis can. But he can't cure both of them, John. No, no, no. That's right. One of them has to lose. Tomorrow, Mary Southern and her dearest friend, Dr. John Benson, make their formal appeal to the district attorney for a trial postponement for Max. Will they get it without Danny's testimony? And will Danny finally decide to testify against Max to save his wife, Phyllis, from the life of an invalid? Be sure to hear tomorrow's dramatic scene from radio's most fascinating serial story, The Life of Mary Southern. The Jack Benny Program. Quality of product is essential to continuing success. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So round, so firm, so fully packed. So free and easy on the draw. L-S-M-F-T. 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 You bet. And how? Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So round, so firm, so fully packed. So free and easy on the draw. Sold American. Independent tobacco experts present at the tobacco auctions can see the makers of Lucky Strike consistently select and buy the finer, the lighter, the naturally milder Lucky Strike tobacco. This fine Lucky Strike tobacco means real deep-down smoking enjoyment for you. So smoke that smoke of fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Larry Stevens, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, last Tuesday was VE Day. But as President Truman said, we still have a problem, and here he is, Jack Benny. Thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, the president, didn't mean me. He meant Japan. Japan, that little body of land surrounded by mimics. <laughs> but getting back to VE Day, this certainly has been an historic week, hasn't it, Don? Oh, it certainly has. And Jack... When you were overseas, I'll bet you had no idea the Germans would surrender when they did. Would, uh, would you mind repeating that, Don? I said when you were overseas, I'll bet you had no idea the Germans would surrender when they did. Don, are you kidding? <laughs> what? Look, now that it can be told, let me tell you something. Now, wait a minute, Jack. You're not going to tell me that you planned the invasion. Oh, you know. <laughs> And we try to keep it a secret. Oh, for heaven's sakes, Jack. You only went overseas to entertain the boys. <laughs> you fell for that, too, huh? <laughs> I didn't fall for anything. If you didn't go overseas to entertain the boys, why did you go? Don, when Churchill comes over here and hands you a note from Eisenhower, you can't say no. <laughs> so let's not... Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Hello, Don. Hi, everybody. Say, you're pretty happy tonight. You're pretty happy tonight, aren't you, Mary? Well, why shouldn't I be? Even though we still have work to do, at least the fighting in Europe is over. That's right. And, Mary, you want to know something? Jack's taking credit for the whole thing. Oh, for heaven's sake, Jack. What do you know about military affairs? Listen, sister, I was in the Navy during the last war, and if I must say so myself, I was a darn good sailor. Some sailor. That was 27 years ago, and you still haven't got your 85 points. <laughs> 
<laughs> Mary, don't be funny. I helped make naval history. Oh, sure, sure. Sure. The first day you joined, you got on a boat, tried to salute an officer, stuck your thumb in your eye, couldn't see where you're going, stepped off the side of the ship. Mary. Your suspenders caught on a nail, and if they hadn't stuck a paintbrush in your hand, you'd have been non-essential. <laughs> All right, all right. Anyway, Don was talking about what I did in this war. That's right, Mary. And Jack claims that he went overseas because Eisenhower sent for him. Eisenhower sent for you? <laughs> well, <laughs> not only that, Mary. Jack said Churchill came over here and handed him the note. Churchill handed you a... Jack, Benny, if you weren't wearing glasses, I'd punch you right in the nose. <laughs> oh, put him back on and stop showing off. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mary, but it's it's little things like that that... Bring out the Errol Flynn in me. <laughs> so, uh, so watch it, kid. <laughs> well, it's your own fault for making up things that aren't true. Churchill handing you a note. I didn't say he actually handed me the note. He came over to my house. I wasn't home, so he walked around to the back porch and stuck it in a milk bottle. <laughs> so naturally, I just... Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? You may not remember me after all these years, but I was in the Navy the same time you were. At Great Lake? Yes, sir. The name is Flanagan. Oh, Flanagan? Seaman third class. Oh. Well, look, uh... <laughs> Flanagan, why don't you sit down and after the show we'll have a bite and talk over old times? Yes, sir. Ha, ha, ha. Hey, Benny, remember the first day you joined the Navy? You got on a ship, saluted an officer, stuck your thumb in your they eye. They know about <laughs> that. They know about that. I'll never forget you hanging there by your suspenders. <laughs> they called you Benny the Human Yo-Yo. <laughs> look, look, Flanagan. Remember the time you had a watch tattooed on your wrist so you wouldn't have to buy one? <laughs> never mind. Then you tried to get your money back because it wouldn't run? <laughs> Flanagan, never mind my tattoo. Now go sit down. Yes, sir. Those were the days. <laughs> Now, where was I? On the back porch with a milk bottle. Oh, yeah. So I read the note from Eisenhower, packed as fast as I could, grabbed the first plane, and when I arrived overseas, who do you think I met? The milkman. He read the note first. <laughs> well, if you're not going to believe anything I say, there's no use letting you in. Hello, about... Mr. Benny. What are you mad about? Oh, nothing, Larry. It's just that I've been telling Mary and Don about my military accomplishments, and they don't believe me. Oh. Well, why don't you tell it to me, Mr. Benny? I'll believe you. You will, kid? Sure. It's in my contract. <laughs> Oh, oh yes. Well, come here, kid. <clears throat> you see, Larry, when I was overseas, I perfected a new system for dive bombing. You did? Yes, and to demonstrate my system, I took a bomber up 5,000 feet, put her into a dive... You and... flew a dive bomber? Certainly. <laughs> what are you laughing at? You're the only man I know who blacks out on a merry-go-round. <laughs> that only happened once. I was reaching for the brass ring and the buckle broke on my safety belt. <laughs> anyway, Larry, I'll tell you more about it later. Let's have your song now. Okay. Hey, Benny. Now what? Remember the time you stuck your head out of the porthole and you couldn't get it back in? Flanagan, uh, look at... Uh, 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 for two weeks, we had to stand on the dock and throw food at you. <laughs> Cut that out. Larry, go ahead and sing. Hmm, throwing food at me. They could at least open the eggs, you know. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
Prayer Away, sung by Larry Stevens. Very good, Larry. And now, kid, as I started to tell you, after I perfected the dive bomber, I came Hiya, back... Hiya, Jackson. Hello, Libby. You clowns getting any laughs? <laughs> oh, hello, Phil. Uh, what do you hear from Vermouth, Vermont? Huh? All right, all right, Jackson. So I made a mistake last week. That can happen to anybody. I know, but it was written right in the script. French Vermouth. And you called it French Vermont. All right, I'm sorry. Don't you know the difference between Vermouth and Vermont? No, I never drank any Vermont. <laughs> you must have been drinking something. Now, wait a minute, Jackson. You ain't going to hang that on me. I've been on the wagon for three months, and I haven't touched a drop. Well, congratulations. For three months, you haven't had a single... Say, Phil, this is the first time I ever noticed it. You've got blue eyes. <laughs> Don, Mary, look. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Libby, give me a mirror. I want to see, too. <laughs> Phil, you can take our word for it. You're very pretty. <laughs> Say, Phil, how's your nightclub doing now that the curfew's been lifted? Oh, swell, Libby, swell. You know, they lifted the ban on racing, too. That, way, that won't make no difference to me, Jackson. We never serve many horses anyway. <laughs> well, it may not make any difference to you, but Crosby is very happy about it. He can race his horses again. Yeah, now that the curfew's lifted, they won't have to come in by midnight. <laughs> Kids, I don't want to change the subject, but you know, next Sunday we're broadcasting from San Francisco. And we're leaving tonight, so I want you all to... I'll take it. Hello? Long distance? Just a minute. Mary, it's for you, Plainfield, New Jersey. Oh, it must be Mama. Yeah. Hello? Hello, Mama. I was going to call you right after the show. Happy Mother's Day. It's good to hear your voice, too. Where's Papa? He's in the refrigerator reading a newspaper. What? Oh, all the other lights have burned out. <laughs> what a family. How's your sister, Babe? I'll find out. Say, Mama, how's Babe? Oh, for heaven's sake, when? What happened, Mary? She got her nose caught in the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> I knew she could do it. <laughs> What's that, Mama? You couldn't remove the vacuum cleaner, so you sent for the head of the FBI? But, Mama, it's a different Hoover that makes gold. I wonder how she breathes with that vacuum cleaner on her nose. Mama, how can Babe breathe with her nose stuck in the vacuum cleaner? Oh, you keep it running. <laughs> Look, Mary, we're doing a program. Mama, I've got to hang up now, so I'll write you along. What's that, Mama? Mary, please. Cousin Bobby got out of the Army under the new system? Well. <laughs> oh, Mama. <laughs> what is it, Mary? Mama said Bobby's been overseas so long, he was discharged and had enough points left over to buy a ham. <laughs> Your mother's a car. Well, goodbye, Mama, and happy Mother's Day. You know, Mary, I like your mother. In fact, today we should all pay tribute to the one person to whom we owe so much. As for myself, I can say, all that I am today, I owe to my mother. Now, wait a minute, Jackson. You ain't going to blame any sweet little old lady on that. <laughs> Phil, just take your vermouth and go back to Vermont. Now, kids, as I started to say before... Hey, Benny, when are you going to get to that clever stuff? What? You know, that part where you go... La, da, da. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't do that. You're talking about the commercials. Yeah, that's the stuff I like. <laughs> the way those guys rush out and say, Why, sure, yes, sir, you bet. Lucky strike means fine tobacco. So round, so firm, so fully packed, so free and easy on the job. <laughs> wait a minute. And, and that train cricket you got. Cricket? Yeah, the one that goes tick, 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 tick. Tick, 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 tick. See, I always thought a man did that. When are you going to get to that? That comes later at the end of the show. Well, hurry up. Get through with your stuff, will you? You're holding things up. All right, all right, Flanagan. Sit down. Now, kids, as I started to tell you, we're all meeting tonight at the station a half hour before our train leaves. i got to run home now because i got some last-minute packing to do. What time is it now, Jack? I don't know. My tattoo isn't running. I mean, my watch isn't running. <laughs> Now, Phil, you and the rest of the gang finish the program and see that nobody misses the train. Okay, Jackson. So long, kids. See you later.
Rochester, I'm late and I've got to hurry. Come on and help me, will you? I've already started packing for you, boss. Oh, swell. How far have you gotten? Well, I packed your iron capsules, scotch emulsion, cod liver oil, yeast tablets, aspirin, sleeping pills, benzodrine, hair tonic, blood tonic, nerve tonic. Now let's get the... Eye drops, nose drops, ear drops, cough drops. Now let's get all the... Corn pads, bunion pads, heating pads, soap, shoulder pads. Now let's... Vitamins A, B, C, D, and L, F, M, F, T. Good. Boss, if you really need all this stuff, you better not go. <laughs> I'm going anyway. Now pack my shirt while I go in the bathroom and get the rest of my toilet articles. Let's see. Toothpaste, toothbrush, shaving cream, razor. Razor. Hmm, let me see. Oh, Rochester, when did I put a new blade in my razor? A uh, new blade? Let me think, boss. Let me think. Oh, yeah, I remember. It was D-Day plus six. <laughs> oh, then this blade is still good. <laughs> but I'll take along a new one. Sometimes they break. <laughs> now, let's see. Shaving brush, face lotion, powder, gargle, throat spray, Sympathy soothing. Yes, 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 happiness. Yes, 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 happiness. Yes, 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 happiness. Now getting away from it. That's Cole Porter, right? Beautiful lyric. <laughs> well, I guess I got everything. How are you doing, Rochester? I'm about half done. Good. And say, Rochester, I've been meaning to tell you. I might be entertaining some important delegates from the conference, like, well, like Anthony Eden. And I want you to be very dignified. Dignified? Yes, I want you to speak with a broad A. You know, can't, don't, command, and so on. Now, repeat this sentence after me. I can't dance this afternoon as I have paint on my pond. Oh, boss, this is so silly. <laughs> There's nothing silly about it. Now, repeat it. Okay. I can't dance this afternoon as I have paint on my pond. That's very good, Roger. And remember it when I'm entertaining in San Francisco. Now, let's get on with the packing. I'll take my socks and put them in a small bag and put my handkerchief. Answer the phone, Rochester. Are you there? <laughs> this is the residence of Jack Benny, star of the cinema, legitimate drama and wireless. Autograph photographs, two for a shilling. Men of the Army, Marines, or His Majesty's Navy, half price. Hey, come again? Oh, this is most distressing. Most distressing. Right home, I'll tell it. Cheerio. Yep, yep. <laughs> Who was that, Roger, sir? Your tailor, sir. He said you can't dance this afternoon unless you pay in advance for your pants. <laughs> now, cut that out. You don't have to begin till we get to San Francisco. Now, you finish packing while I go into my vault and get some money. Tell me, Ed. I want to get into my safe. Oh, it's you, Mr. Benny. Yes. Well, we're having very lovely weather now, Ed. It's spring again. Spring? That must be nice. <laughs> By the way, Ed, I've got some good news for you. The war in Europe is over. Germany surrendered on Tuesday. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, did they, um, did they catch the Kaiser? <laughs> No, no, Ed, that was... Oh, I'll explain it to you some other time. Right now, I'd like to open my safe. Very good, sir. Shall I put on my blindfold? Of course not, Ed. Of course not. I trust you. 
Now, let's see. The combination is right to 45, left to 160, back to 15, then left to 110, there. I'll be in San Francisco for ten days. There'll be hotel bills, meals, entertainment, tips. Fifteen dollars ought to be enough. <laughs> Maybe I should take twenty. Nah, if I take a lot, I'll just spend it. I'll take fifteen. But then again, maybe I'll need twenty. Oh well, I'll play safe and take seventeen fifty. <laughs> there. Goodbye, Mr. Benny. Goodbye, Ed. See you in the fall. I'll be here. <laughs> well, come on, Rochester. We better hurry to the station. I hope my gang is there. Rochester, check my bag. I'm going over to the information booth to make sure about the time our train leaves. Yes, sir. Uh, pardon me. Are you the information clerk? Well, what do you think I am in this cage? A bird of paradise? <laughs> I always have to run into him. Look, I'm going to San Francisco. Well, well, don't tell me the La Brea Tar Pits is sending a delegate to the concert. <laughs> Don't be funny. All I want to know is when my train leaves for San Francisco. And if you won't tell get me... Get your hands off my desk. I just want to look it up and... Stop the... crumpling my time table. Then will you please tell me what time my train leaves for San Francisco? Well, which train do you want to go on? The lark or the owl? Well, what's the difference? The lark can sing, silly. <laughs> look, I want to go on the... Track five for Anaheim, Azusa, and Cucamonga. Oh, there's Marion Phil. Here I am, kids. Hurry up, Jack. Our train's about to leave. Come on, Jackson. Okay, I'll be right with you. Train leaving on track five for Anaheim, Azusa, and Cucamonga. Train leaving on track five for Anaheim, Azusa, and Cucamonga. Around Miss Cucamonga. Mary, Phil, stop dancing! Our train, Jack, we'll be back in just a minute with a very important message. But first, here's my good friend, L.A. Speed Race. If all it is Quality of product is essential to continuing success. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. And that's quality where fine quality counts. Right in the tobacco itself. Yes, Lucky Strike means fine. Fine tobacco, the finer, the lighter, the naturally milder Lucky Strike tobacco. So smoke that smoke of fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. So round, so firm, so fully packed, 
so free and easy on the draw. The famous tobacco auctioneers heard on tonight's program are Mr. L.A. Speed Riggs of Goldsboro, North Carolina. And Mr. F.E. Boone of Lexington, Kentucky. And this is Basil Risedale speaking. L.S.M.F.T. 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 Fine tobacco makes a fine cigarette. So smoke that smoke of fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. So round, so firm, so fully packed, so free and easy on the draw. Ladies and gentlemen... It seems like more than a coincidence that Mother's Day should fall on the first Sunday after V.E. Day. And today, glowing tributes have been paid to mothers everywhere. At this moment, I wish it were possible to tune in on the hearts and thoughts of the mothers whose fighting sons are far away from home. From them, we would learn the true meaning of V.E. Day and Mother's Day. They probably wouldn't express their feelings in a lot of fancy words. Perhaps they couldn't. But then they don't have to because we can see in their faces not only sorrow and anxiety, but courage and faith. Mothers who have given the most and asked the least are doing the hardest job to be done in war. Staying at home, waiting. So today, our thoughts and prayers are with all mothers as well as the hope that by next Mother's Day, their Johnnies will have come marching home. Jack Benny program. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, on this momentous occasion, we're broadcasting from the magnificent Civic Auditorium in historic city of San Francisco. San Francisco, known the world over for its luxurious buildings, its beautiful Golden Gate, its extensive harbor, its gigantic and impressive bridges. And by the time he gets to me, I won't mean a thing. <laughs> Now I know how Berkeley feels. <laughs> so from this colorful city, we bring you that Yankee Doodle Dandy, Jack Benny. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, it certainly is thrilling to be here in San Francisco, a city that reminds me so much of Waukegan. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, now, wait a minute, Jack. I don't blame you for being proud of your hometown, but let's not be ridiculous. Ridiculous? Are you kidding, Don? Mention one thing that San Francisco has that Waukegan hasn't got. Well, uh, 
Waukee doesn't have the bridges, the Golden Gate, Fisherman's Wharf, Pave Street, electric lights, department stores, <laughs> automobiles, bicycles, trees. Ha, and... ha, I knew if I let you go, you'd hang yourself. We've got bicycles. <laughs> They may have high front wheels, but we've got them. <laughs> Nevertheless, I do agree with you, Don. San Francisco is a beautiful city. Ah, you bet it is, Jack. But a funny thing happened to me this morning when I was walking down Knob Hill. Walking down Knob at the Hill? Yes. Right? When I got halfway down, I stopped to rest. And a traffic cop came over and made me point my toes into the curb. <laughs> Well, you can't blame him, Don. If you ever started rolling, you'd flatten everything south of Market Street. <laughs> you know, when, when you're out for a stroll, you look like a walking plenary session. <laughs> You've got plenty of plenary there, brother. Too, huh, man? And, Don, if you notice how crowded it is here in San Francisco... It was just fortunate that I made my reservations eight months ago. Oh, well, then you were lucky, Jack. Where are you living? At the top of the mark? No, at the bottom of the Lancashire. <laughs> but it's really beautiful down there. You can look up and see the bay. You know? <laughs> of course, after five days, I had to give up my room, and I'm now living at the Claremont Hotel in Berkeley. You know, that's near Oakland. But, Jack, you come over to San Francisco so often with that toll bridge. Don't you find it rather expensive crossing the bay? Not at all, Don. It just happens that I brought my bathing suit with me. <laughs> you know. Well, Jack, isn't that a little dangerous? It wasn't until yesterday the Coast Guard came out after me that thought I was a German submarine giving myself up. <laughs> I wouldn't have minded that so much, but they fired a shot across my bow. Fortunately, I was bowing at the time. <laughs> Hiya, Jackson. All right, folks, you're all in clover because Harris is here and the law is over. <laughs> Hey, Phil, how are you enjoying San Francisco? Oh, it's great, Don. This is really a pretty village, especially at night. When you're looking down at the city from the top of a tall building and all the colored lights are flashing on and off, gosh, it's beautiful. Looks just like a pinball machine. <laughs> oh, fine, comparing San Francisco to a pinball machine. Sure, Jackson, the whole town is tilted. <laughs> Tilted? Yeah, Frankie, my guitar player, said it's the first time he's ever been sober in the city cockeye. <laughs> well, I hope the change wasn't too much of a shock to him. By the way, Phil, where are you and Frankie living? Well, we couldn't find the room, Jackson, so we've been spending all our time up the top of the mark. Oh, that must be beautiful. Yeah, what a view. On a clear day, you can see the bar. <laughs> I know, I know. And say, Jackson, you want to hear something cute? Why? Well, last night, Frankie had a couple of drinks. And you know those big turntables they have at the end of the cable car line? You mean those turntables that revolve the, ca uh, they revolve the cable cars on? Yeah, well, Frankie kept watching them all one night. Then uh -huh. finally he walked over to the conductor and said, Listen, chum, I've been here for seven hours. When are you going to put on one of Crosby's records? <laughs> Well, Phil, I can understand Frankie standing there for seven hours. What were you doing there? I was waiting for that's what I like about the South. <laughs> well, Phil, all I can say... Well, here comes our little songbird. Hello, Larry. Hello, Mr. Benny. Larry, I was looking for you all week to find out what you're going to sing today. Where are you living? Oh, I'm at the Sir Francis Drake. I have a lovely room overlooking... A room overlooking what? I don't know. It hasn't got a window. Oh. <laughs> well, it's so crowded here, they probably stuck you in a broom closet. Go ahead, kid. Let's have your song. Come on. Let's have it. I see stars in your eyes When my lips beg your lips to surrender Stars in your eyes When we kiss and you whisper Oh, 
Someday I'd like Hello, to... Hello, Jack. Hello, Mary. Someday I'd like to... Wait a minute, you're not Mary. No, I'm Rita Hayworth. Oh, Rita Hayworth. <laughs> well, Rita, this is certainly a surprise. What are you doing here? Well, Jack, I stopped in to visit Mary at a hotel, and she had a very bad cold. Oh, yes. I bet I know how she caught that cold. She crossed the bay with me and didn't bring a towel. <laughs> no, that's too bad. I know that Mary would have been thrilled to be here. She really would. Anyway, Jack, Mary asked me to come over here and take her place. Well, that's awfully sweet of you, Rita, and naturally I don't expect you to do this for nothing. I suppose Mary told you that I'll pay you the same salary that I'm paying her. Yes, but I came anyway. <laughs> Oh, Rita, you little vixen, you. But no kidding, I'm so glad you're here because, well, I wanted to tell you that I've often, in fact, I, no, I better not say it. Huh? <laughs> what is it, Jack? You can tell me. No, you'll only think I'm a silly kid. No, I won't, I promise. Well, okay, I'll confess, Rita, that I, little Jack Benny, have often dreamed about you. Why, I think that's sweet. Oh, but Jack, when you dreamed about me, did you ever dream that I'd be on your program? No, I always kept business out of it. <laughs> uh, say, Rita, while you're here in San Francisco, where are you staying, in Berkeley or Oakland? Oh, I have a very nice room right here at the Palace Hotel. The Palace Hotel? Right here in town? Yes. Well, imagine getting a room right... What have you got that I haven't got? Mm. Nothing, nothing, but I'm supposed to walk that way. <laughs> Got that over with a bang, kid. <laughs> no. Well, uh, Miss, uh, Miss Hayworth, I want to tell you how much I enjoyed your latest Columbia musical tonight and every night. I thought you were wonderful in it. Thank you, Don. Oh, yes, I saw it, too. And by the way, Rita... I have a picture playing here in San Francisco this week. It's called The Horn Blows at Midnight, and it's doing terrific business. Yes, I know, Jack, but uh, don't you think you're unfair trying to cash in on Bing Crosby's reputation? Well... Imagine changing the title from The Horn Blows at Midnight to Blowing My Way. <laughs> well, I know what I'm doing, sister. I'm a businessman, you know. Well, Jack, if you're such a businessman, why did you jip the cable car company out of their fare? What do you mean, Jeff? I saw you on Powell Street. Huh? When you thought no one was looking, you walked out in the middle of the street, got down on your knees, stuck your finger in the slot, hooked it around the cable, and let it pull you up the hill for nothing. <laughs> oh, I just did that for a gag. You know, people expect me to be funny. Hey, Jack, and after the show, I got a little spot and we'll, uh... Hey, who's this happy little bundle of Technicolor? <laughs> Okay, okay. Rita, I'd like you to meet Whispering Phil Harris. <laughs> Hello, Jack. Hello, Rita. 
Hello, Phil. Oh, brother, all this is a salary, too. This is it. I bet if she ever walked into the conference, she'd be whistled at in 46 different languages. Well, Phil. You know, Rita, the minute I seen you, I knew you were my type. Slow sir. down, Phil. She's married. She's married to Orson Welles. Who's he? <laughs> Rita, you tell him. Well, my husband is an actor, a writer, a director, a producer, a columnist, and a commentator. Well, if he's that busy, what am I worried about? <laughs> Don't mind him, Rita. He just came with the band. The union says you gotta have one. Oh, he doesn't bother me, Jack. And I think I'd better be running along now. See you later. Wait a minute, Rita. What's your rush? Where are you going? Well, I've got to hurry over to the Bay Bridge. And there's such a crowd there, I want to get a place close to the rail. Close to the rail? Why? Well, I understand every afternoon... Some eccentric fellow swims across the bay. Oh, oh, I see. <laughs> well, it takes all kinds of people to make a world. <laughs> anyway, Rita, thanks very much for coming over, and I'm sure Mary appreciates it, too. Goodbye. So long, Jack. It was nice of her to come over and leave Orson all by himself. And now... You like that one, Orson? And now, ladies and gentlemen, tonight, as an added attraction, we have another surprise for you. A very dear friend of mine who has entertained the boys overseas in both theaters of war and is preparing to go again. The world's greatest harmonica player, Larry Adler. Thank you. 
City Americana, played by Larry Adler. Larry, that was wonderful. Thank you, Jack. You pronounced it so well, too. Jack, we certainly had a lot of fun on, on those overseas trips, didn't we? We sure did. And, Larry, when you played your harmonica, the boys really went for it. I know, Jack. And when you played your violin, the boys really went. Hmm. I'd answer that, but I have another important introduction to make. Oh, who are you going to introduce now, Jack? The governor of California. You mean the governor is here? Yes. What have we done now? Nothing. And now, one of the honored guests here, Governor Earl Warren. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Jack. Gosh, Governor, I'm so excited. You know, this is the first time I've ever had a governor on my program. I don't know how to act. I mean, I, I don't know what to do. Well, for one thing, stand up. You don't have to curtsy. Oh, oh, oh I didn't know. <laughs> well, Jack, I just want to tell you how happy we are to have you here in San Francisco at this time. I did meet one very important person who really knows what it's all about. In fact, I had lunch with him twice. His name is Mr. Dyer. Edward Dyer. Edward J. Dyer? Yes. Do you happen to know him? Well, I should. He's my chauffeur. <laughs> Well, he's a, he's a lovely fellow. Anyway, Governor, it's been a great pleasure to be here in San Francisco, and my cast and I feel highly honored having been asked to appear on this program. <laughs> Goodbye, Governor. Goodbye, Jack. Oh, my goodness. What's the matter, Jack? I meant to ask the governor to come to the big reception I'm giving in my honor tonight. You know, um, Mayor Lapham is going to be there, too. Mayor Lapham? Yeah, he's the one who wears those zoot neckties, you know. Oh. Those <laughs> well, I'll get in touch with the governor later, and I'm sure he'll... There's the phone. I'll get it. Hello? Hello, oh, Mr. Bay. This is Rod Jesse. <laughs> Hello, Rochester. What is it? I wanted to let you know that everything is all set for the reception you're giving tonight. Well, I hope you explained it was absolutely free. Uh-huh. And I also explained that you'd have a plate by the door in case any, in case they wanted to show their appreciation. Rochester, that plate is there for calling cards. It never was before. <laughs> Well, I'll talk to you about that later. Will you be home when I get there? Go! <laughs> all right, all right. Goodbye. You've been listening to the Jack Benny Program with Phil Harris, Larry Stevens. Good health to all from Rexall. It's Sunday, time for the Phil Harris Alice Fay Show, presented by the makers of Rexall Drug Products and your Rexall Family Drug. 
Good evening. This is your Rexall family druggist taking a little time from behind the prescription counter this Sunday evening to speak for all 10,000 of us. The 10,000 druggists who have added the word Rexall to our own store names. You can always tell us by the orange and blue Rexall sign in our windows. The sign means that we carry the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. They range all the way from aspirin to penicillin, and they're as fine and pure and dependable as science can make them. We recommend them to our customers because we know you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. And now your Rexall family druggist brings you the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show. Written by Ray Singer and Dick Chevrolet, with Elliot Lewis, Walter Tetley, Robert North, Janine Roos, Ann Whitfield, Walter Scharf and his music, yours truly, Bill Foreman, and starring Alice Faye and Phil Harris. It is four o'clock in the Harris household, and the children have just arrived home from school. They're an hour late, and Phil and Alice are a little upset. Well, it's about time you children got home. Where have you been? Yeah, why were you so late? The teacher kept us after school, Daddy. Yeah, she said the homework we did last night was all wrong. So? (laughs) My children can't grasp the simple things they teach in the elementary grades. The trouble is you don't pay no attention. You think you know everything. You won't listen to your elders. Now, after this, if you have any trouble, come to me with your homework. That's what we did last night, Dad. (laughs) Oh. And what makes your teacher so sure it was wrong? said George Washington was the first president, not Petrillo. Well, that's a moot point. Daddy, the teacher gave us these pamphlets for you to read. Let me see them, children. Hmm. These might help you, Phil. Political history of our country, current issues of the political campaign, party platform. Hold it, Myrtle, hold it. Just... <laughs> Take it easy. You might not know it, but I don't have to read pamphlets to know what's going on in this country. I'm right up to the minute on world affairs and current events, like every good American citizen should be. Well, I'm glad you feel that way, because there's something I forgot to tell you. The election committee called, and they want us to help out at the election on Tuesday. Election? Mm Mm-hmm. Somebody's running for something? (laughs) We're voting for a president. They want me to work at the polls, and they want you to go around the neighborhood and get the people to vote. Oh, but Alice, I can't be bothered with that stuff. Let somebody else do it. Oh, Phil, that's not the right attitude. This is an important election. That's right, Daddy. The teacher says it's the duty of everyone to do their part. Please do it, Daddy. We'll be proud of you. You'll be running the election and helping to pick the president. Yes, Phyllis, but I can... Running the election, huh? (laughs) be picking a president, huh? Well, if it's up to me to pick them, we don't need no election. We'll call the whole thing off. I'll make big changes. Bill. Yes, big changes. I'll make a clean sweep of the whole country. I'll Bill, be... stop swinging your arms. If anybody came in and... Yes, sir, them... I'll sweep it. Bill, look what you did. Oh, well, gee, I didn't know that anybody was in back of me. It's my brother, William. You knocked him out. <laughs> Oh, as I was saying, I'll sweep everybody. I got... Phil, don't let him lie there. Help him up. Okay, okay. How is he, Phil? How is he? Is he unconscious? With Willie, it's hard to tell. <laughs> yeah, he's out all right, honey, but I'll bring him to Well, him. hurry, Phil. Rub his wrist. Slap his face. Not with your fist. <laughs> come on, Willie. Willie, come on. Snap out of it. Willie, come on. Snap out. I'm sorry it happened. I didn't even know you were there, and I... Well, Willie, say something, Willie. Speak to me. Good morning, Celeste. For that, I had to bring him, too. I'm glad you're all right, Willie. 
It was an accident. I don't believe it. I think he did it on purpose. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Phil would never hit you on purpose, would you, Phil? Nah. <laughs> carried away with himself when I told him about his being appointed to the election committee. Yes, sir, and they showed great judgment. Who could do a better job of getting those women out to vote? Why, I'll have them dames eaten out of my hand. All I got to do is call at their homes, turn on that Harris charm, and I'll have all hold them women it, coming... Hold Buster, up. hold it. <laughs> Philip, frankly, I don't think the committee made a very wise choice. The importance of voting in this election should be explained to the people, and I don't think you're capable of doing it. I doubt if you even know who's running. I don't know who's... Oh, Oglethorpe. <laughs> Homer J. Oglethorpe, please. Go buy yourself a new snuff box. But you know, answer me. Who is running? Oh, you don't know, huh? Well, of course I know. Among the candidates, Thomas E. Dewey, Harry Truman, Henry Wallace, Norman Thomas, and J. Strom Thurmond. But of course. <laughs> I hope you know, Phil. I didn't want to tell you, but several of the committee members questioned your ability to do the job. In fact, a few of them are coming over this evening. They question to... my ability. My ability. Well. <laughs> this is... This is the sort of a thing that cuts a man to the quick. Bill, they're just coming over to find out if you're capable of handling it. You have to have a knowledge of politics in case people ask questions. Let them ask questions. Let them ask questions. Let them interrogate me. What was that last word? Me. Yeah, me. Me. <laughs> I can explain to those people the importance of voting this year. It's the political issues involved which concern the, uh, well, the, uh, I'll get it. Glad that bell rang. I really don't know too much about this. There must be some way I can find out before election. Hi, Curly. Frankie. Hey. Hey, what do you know about politics? Everything. <laughs> I probably know as much about politics as I do about music. Uh-oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> Not if there's anything you want to know, just ask me. I'll take a chance. Now, look. Who are you voting for in the presidential election? I ain't voting. I don't believe in changing presidents. Well, some people think we should. Well, that's because they haven't followed the career of our president as closely as I have. I say the man's doing a good job. And as long as he continues to do a good job, let's keep Hoover there. <laughs> Frankie. Yes? Mr. Truman is the president of the United States, not Hoover. Oh, oh, good. I was thinking of Canada. <laughs> now, is there anything else you want to know? Yeah. Have you seen a doctor about that slow leak in your head? <laughs> Look, Remley, I'm on the election committee, and they're coming over tonight to find out what I know about the different parties. Curly, your education's been sadly neglected. Didn't you learn anything in school? First thing they taught me was that there are two major parties, the Whigs and the Tories. <laughs> Those two I know about. <laughs> There's more? <laughs> well, there must be. There are a lot of other fellows running this, this year. There's Harry Truman, Thomas E. Dewey, Henry Wallace, J. Strom Thurman, and Thomas. Thomas? John Charles. <laughs> Look, Remley, you know even less than I do about this, and it's our duty to find out about it. I hope you realize the importance of voting. Well, of course I do. Look at my poor father. One year he didn't vote, and they passed prohibition. <laughs> and what's wrong with prohibition? I mean, worse things than that can happen, like having an atom bomb go off in your hand or something. I mean, after all, Remley, you don't know anything. Don't you know anybody that I can talk to who knows politics? Well, why do you have to know about it? Well, because we have to know what we're doing when we vote. If we pick the wrong guy, we can get into as much trouble as people did when they had that, uh, that Nebuchadnezzar. What was wrong with him? Well, besides his name. What was wrong with him? Oh, 
Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. There was three children from the land of Israel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. They took a little trip to the land of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon, Shadrach. Meshach Abednego, we took a lot of gold and made him an idol. Shat back, Meshach Abednego. And he told everybody when you hear the music of the cornet and the blue and the horn. You must fall down and worship that idol. Shat back, Meshach Abednego. But the children of Israel would not bow down. Shat back, Meshach Abednego. You couldn't fool them with a golden idol. Shat back, Meshach Abednego. I said you couldn't fool them with a golden idol. So the king put the children in the fire furnace. Shadrach, me, Shadrach, Then he thawed the coals in the red hot brimstone. Shadrach, me, Shadrach, Seven times hotter, hotter than it ought to be. Shadrach, Shadrach. He burned up the soldiers the king had put down. Shadrach, me, Shadrach, The Lord sent an angel with snowy white wings down in the middle of that furnace, talking to the children about the power of the gospel. Shadrach. Well, they couldn't even burn a hair on the head of that Shadrach. Me, Shack, Abednego, laughing and talking while the fire was a jungle. Shadrach! The Lord was on their side. Old Nebuchadnezzar called Hey there when he saw the power of the Lord. And they had a big time in the house of Babylon. Shadrach! Shadrach! Me, Curly, I've been thinking. Why do you have to ask somebody about politics? Books have been written on the subject. You must have one in the house. Yeah, yeah, we must have. Hey, hmm? let's look at my book collection and see. Your book collection? <laughs> Naturally. I have quite an extensive library. Mm-hmm. There they are. Go ahead, look for yourself. Oh. Ruby out of Omer Khayyam. <laughs> Emerson's Essays, Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire, Masochistic Tendencies of the Malayan. That one was excellent. A smasher. You liked it, huh? Well, that and Homer's Iliad, I, I just couldn't put them down. I, I suggest you read it, Mr. Remley. Yes, maybe I would. No. I'll wait till I make the picture. <laughs> See what else you got here. The architectural influence of the Elizabethan era. The Rover Boys at Tehachapi. Curl. <laughs> Alice, she goes for that light frosty stuff. Uh-huh. Of course, of course. Ah, here's a book that'll help us, Curly. The Machination of Political Regimes During the Industrial Revolution. Ideal for our purpose, Mr. Remley. Right. Now, let's see. Uh-uh. Come on. Uh-uh. Hey, Remley. What? We'll never understand this. The words are too big and complicated oh, Bill, for us. Bill, I... Oh, hello, Frank. Hi, Hi, Alice. Hey, Alice. I've been thinking about it, and... Hey, uh... Maybe I shouldn't serve on that committee. Oh, but, Phil, I think you should. It's important to call at people's homes and get them out to vote. I know that, but they're going to ask me questions, and if I can't answer them, they won't even let me in their homes. Hey, Curly, I got an idea. Why don't you practice on Alice and me? Pretend we're a married couple and you're trying to get us to vote. Okay, Remley, I'll... Wait a minute. <laughs> you and Alice are married? Mm-hmm. I don't like that. <laughs> don't be a child. We're only playing house. <laughs> Go on, now, you go to the door and ring the bell All right, I'll try it once Okay, Alice Now, we'll make like we're a married couple Mm -hmm. You put your head on my shoulder I'll put my arm around you like Mm -hmm. this Uh (laughs) Is it comfy, dear? Mm, Yes, darling Wait! (laughs) 
We ain't gonna do it that way, Remley. Please, don't tell me how to play house. Now, go on, you, you go outside and ring the bell and I'll let you in. And let me in fast, brother. I don't want no pause between me and the bell ring. And the door opening. Let's make it all work fast, huh? All right, all right but see if you get the door open. I'm going to try. No lulls, Dad. No lulls. Look, Alice, we got to make it tough for Curly. We'll pretend we're not interested in voting, and it's up to him to convince us that we should. Miss Faye, I'll bring your groceries in the kitchen. Oh, thanks, Julius. Hi, Mr. Renly. Where's Mr. Harris? All right, beat it, kid. We're busy. Go on, scram. Scram! Stop pushing, Mac. <laughs> I'll go. I ain't overjoyed at the prospect of your company anyway. Someone's at the door, darling. Well, answer it, sweetie pie. Be- <laughs> go away, will you? I'm talking to Alice. There's someone at the door, Angel. I'll get it, honey. Let's get it together, sweetheart. <laughs> Honey, sweetheart, this is certainly a nauseating situation. <laughs> I'd better sneak up and find out what's going on. I'll open the door, dearest. Careful of your itty bitty hands, Cookie Pie. <laughs> I don't know which is more nauseating the situation or the dialogue. <laughs> Uh, hello. Uh-oh, it's Mr. Harris. Now the fireworks start. <laughs> Madam, uh, my name is Phil Harris. Does he have to introduce himself every time he comes home? <laughs> I'd like to talk to you, lady. May I come in? Oh, not now. I'm very busy. Come back some other time. Well, uh, well, if I can't talk to you, may I talk to your husband? He's got to ask her if it's all right to talk to himself. <laughs> I'm sorry, but my husband is busy is and I... Is somebody at the door, darling? I... Oh... Well, and who is this? <laughs> How can he act so innocent? <laughs> oh, this is Mr. Harris, darling. Oh? Mr. Harris, I'm Mrs. Harris. And this is my husband, Mr. Renly. <laughs> I guess I just don't understand these Hollywood marriages. Wow. What's on your mind, Harris? Well, there's something I got to talk to you two about. There's something I must know. Uh Uh-oh, here's where the shooting starts. (laughs) What do you want to know? Are you two voting next Tuesday? (laughs) Now, there's a shrewd question. (laughs) I can't stand no more of this. Mr. Harris, can't you see what's going on? Oh, yes. Julius, what are you doing in here? He delivered the groceries. Oh. We thought he left. Oh. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, Mr. Lindley. Call him his fake cookie pie right in front of poor Mr. Harris. Hey. <laughs> hey, what do you know? <laughs> the kid's sticking up for me. Yeah, I'm sticking up for you. I can't let your wife do this to you just because you're a poor, broken down old musician who ain't got enough. Pepper. Never mind. <laughs> Get off my side. Now, <laughs> feed it, will you, kid? Go on back to the grocery. Okay, Get okay. out of it. All right. <laughs> Darn, kid spoiled the whole thing. Now we don't even... Oh. Well, I wasn't doing too well anyway. Well, Phil, it might help you if, you if you read those pamphlets the children brought home from school. They explain the candidates, their platforms, and how the government is run in a very simple language. Yeah the pamphlets. Hey, come on, Frankie. We got just time to read them things before the committee gets here. Come on. See you later, honey. See, See, it's nice to see Phil take an interest in the election. Maybe he'll find out a few things about our country. It's a big place and there's a lot to learn, such as copper comes from Arizona, peaches come from Georgia, and lobsters come from Maine. The wheat fields are the sweet fields of Nebraska And Kansas gets bonanzas from the grain Old whiskey comes from old Kentucky 
ain't the country like me. New Jersey gives us blue. And you, you come from Rhode Island, and little old Rhode Island is famous for you. Cotton comes from Louisiana, gophers from Montana, and spuds from Idaho. Where most beef and for roast beef seems to grow. Grand Canyons come from Colorado. Both comes from Nevada. Yes, and the bosses also do. And you, you come from Rhode Island. And little old Rhode Island is famous for you. Pencils come from Pennsylvania. And chants from Tennessee. They know me where they grow mink in Wyoming. A camp chair in New Hampshire, that's for me. And did you know that a minnow? Yeah. Comes from Minnesota. A coat come from Dakota. But why should you be blue? For you, you come from Rhode Island. Hey, Frankie, did you finish reading all the pamphlets? Uh, yeah. Pretty interesting, aren't they? If you say so. <laughs> well, they are. According to these pamphlets, almost any kid in this country has a chance to grow up and be president. Not having any kids, I ain't interested. <laughs> but supposing you did. Just picture it, Frankie. Someday you get married, and after a year or two, the stork comes to your house, and who knows? The little one might grow up to be president. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yeah. I'm the only stork that ever grew up to be president. <laughs> Look, Curly, forget my kid and think about your committee. They'll be here soon. Now, can you memorize everything you read? Well, I hope so. There's an awful lot to remember, though. All right, I'll brief you. First, our form of government is divided into three branches, legislative, executive, and judiciary. You know all the candidates and their different platforms, and of course you know that we don't elect our president through popular vote. We send members to the electoral college who in turn elect the president. You follow me? Yeah, I got most of it. <laughs> but what was that stuff after you said, I'll brief you? Tell you once more. The government is the... Wait a minute. Too late, Frankie. Now, there's the committee. Oh. I think I'll remember everything if they'll just start asking questions fast before I forget. Well, don't wait. Start I'm talking politics start. as soon as they can. I will. Oh, Bill. Be... Bill, the committee is here. Uh, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Cohen, this is my husband, Mr. Harris. How do you do, Mr. Harris? How are you, sir? Our government is divided into three branches. <laughs> the legislative, the executive, and the Jewish Jitsonary. <laughs> How am I doing with my answers, Alice? Not bad, considering they haven't asked you any questions yet. <laughs> well, won't you be seated, gentlemen? Oh, thank you, but we can't stay long. Uh, now, Mr. Harris, we're merely here to find out if you're familiar with election procedure. We know you are, but some voters might ask silly questions like, how is the president elected? Well, that I know. Now, the president is not elected by popular vote. Instead, we vote to send members to an electrical college. <laughs> And after they graduate from college, they vote for us, and that's why it takes four years to elect the president. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's a very keen analysis. <laughs> yes. Mr. Harris has a great brain. Someday we hope to find out who graded it. <laughs> Mr. Harris, do you know anything at all about politics? Do you know who you're going to vote for yourself? Naturally. 
I've made up my mind, and I know exactly who I'm going to vote for. Uh, well, off the record, I hope you're voting for Mr. Truman. Of course. Who else? I think Mr. Dewey is the better man. That's what I said. Mr. Dewey, by all means. <laughs> of course, there are people who like Mr. Sermon. And I'm one of those people. How do you feel about last You year? couldn't find a better man to cut that up. <laughs> Mr. Harris, according to you, you're voting for three men. Do you think we should have three presidents at the same time? Why not? While one is joining Indian tribes and the second one is out fishing, the third one can stay at the White House and get some work done. <laughs> Mr. Johnson, I think we've heard enough. Shall we go? Yes, yes. Mr. Harris, I don't think you're the man for the election committee. Unfortunately, we can't prevent you from voting yourself, but we... Uh... <laughs> we can keep you from lousing up everybody else. <laughs> Good night, sir. Oh, but gentlemen, Mr. Harris... Good night, Mrs. Harris. You have our deepest sympathy. <laughs> You didn't know what you were talking about at all. Well, I was trying to... Being on the committee isn't too important, but before you vote, I wish you'd find out more about the candidate. You're right, Alice. You're absolutely right. And I'll admit I don't know too much about them, and it's our duty, and it's the duty of everyone to vote intelligently on Tuesday. I'm going to start reading up on the candidates right now. Oh, me too. I didn't realize it before, but now I know it's important to pick the right man. Well, come on, Frankie. Let's study these facts. Now, this explains the platforms of Mr. Truman, Mr. Dewey, Mr. Wallace, Mr. Thurman, and Mr. Frankie. What are you doing? Hmm? Well, I'm choosing the man I'm going to vote for. Well, how are you doing it? I'm putting all the names in a hat, and I'm going to pick one. <laughs> oh, Remley, you can't do it that way. It's too late. I already picked a name out. Here it is. I'm voting for... Funny, I didn't even put this one in. <laughs> Who is it? Some guy named Stetson. You picked out the label. <laughs> Remley, sit down. We're going to read this book right now. Phil and Alice will be back in just a moment. Pardon me, mister, but where can I find a Rexall drugstore? Well, they're all over the country, my friend. Ten thousand of them. Most of them independent family druggists like me. But you can always tell them by the orange and blue Rexall sign in the window. And that sign means they sell Rexall drug products? Exactly. More than two thousand of them. Yes, we Rexall druggists may disagree about politics and football teams, but there's one thing we're really sold on. I know. Rexall drug products. Right, my friend. You see, we druggists know that Rexall products are carefully and purely compounded, that they're tested over and over again, and that they're constantly being improved by the never-ending research that goes on in Rexall's big laboratory. So when our customers ask us to recommend a brand, we just naturally tell them you... You can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Now, how did you know that? Because I found, found it out for myself. <laughs> Why do you think I was looking for a Rexall drugstore in the first place? <laughs> See you next Sunday, folks. Good night now for the makers of Rexall drug products in your Rexall family druggist. Look for the blue and orange sign in their windows. It means they carry the 2,000 or more Rexall drug products. And these 10,000 family druggists tell you, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. This is Bill Foreman wishing good health to all from Rexall. Sunday is fun day on NBC. Stay tuned to this station for the Edgar Burke and Charlie McCarthy show, which follows immediately. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. For Swan Soap, it's Bob Hope. <laughs> With Doris Day, Jack Cookwood, Irene Ryan, you're truly High Aberback, Les Brown and his band of renown, and our special guest, Jack Benny. And here he is, Paramount calls him the Great Lover, but Lever Brothers call him the Great Lather, Bob Hope! <laughs> Thank 
you. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is Bob Christmas is coming, Hope, telling all you people that you and Swan Soap ought to get chummy. It's a soap that's good for brother, sister, dad, and mummy. And if you use it, you'll never feel crummy because the lather's so thick you can lie in the tub and build a snowman on your tummy. <laughs> it's fun. I tried it. <laughs> well, I just got back from Texas. It was wonderful to be down in that Texas sunshine where men are men and women are women. Especially after California where it's so smoggy you just have to guess. <laughs> yes, sir. The whole country's on instruments out here, aren't they? <laughs> I went to Texas to appear at a milk fun show, see a football game, check an oil well, go quail hunting, and get some rest. It was so much fun, I wish I could have stayed for a second day. <laughs> I really do. And that Texas is really rugged and uh, rough country. It's the only state with a mule to whip Frankie Lane. <laughs> Eamon Carter gave me a cowboy hat for Phil Harris, a 20-gallon hat. Has two faucets and a Filipino bartender. <laughs> And are they rich in Texas? They refer to Ali Khan as the sharecropper who married our Rita. <laughs> Rita's husband, Ali Khan, was down in Texas, too. He's trying to strike a midget gusher that will produce baby oil. <laughs> no sweet yoga. And they don't have house detectives in the hotels down there. It's just a big sign of the transom. Remember, the eyes of Texas are upon you. <laughs> And over the weekend, I saw the Notre Dame SMU football classic. There was a game. What weaving, bobbing, ducking, and squirming. Then just when I get under the fence, they made me go outside and buy a ticket. <laughs> when I walked in the stadium, they really rolled out the red carpet. I was wearing my low-cut polo shirt, and they thought I was Princess Margaret. <laughs> but what a game. It was so tense and exciting. During one play, I looked around at the spectators, and three camels were smoking doctors. <laughs> What a battle. I can't describe how exciting it was, but there was a Chesterfield billboard that went into the stadium, and before the first quarter was over, Arthur Godfrey ran out of cigarettes. <laughs> Most of the Texas boys are farmers, too, you know. In one play, the SMU quarterback put his hand down to the center to get the ball. The center grabbed his fingers, and before they could stop him, he got three quarts of milk. <laughs> Notre Dame was driving down the field in one play when suddenly the captain said, we better lose a few yards, fellas. We're too far ahead of Bill Stern. Bill Stern, that's the Lawrence Olivier of the sports announcers. When SMU drove down to Notre Dame's goal line, he made it sound so dramatic that a posse rode in from Houston. They thought it was another attack on the Alamo. And in honor of my latest picture, there were signs all over Fort Worth saying, The Great Lover is coming. When I got off the plane, somebody said, Is that The Great Lover? I thought Alvin Barkley was a much younger man. Say, hey friends, are you a bathtub baritone or a shower soprano? Because if you don't sing in the bathtub or whistle in the shower, you owe it to yourself to switch to Swan Soap. For Swan's wonderful free sudsing action really makes you want to sing when you bathe. Out of sheer delight, almost a minute it touches water, this miracle all-purpose floating soap turns up a mountain of suds that rinses away dirt and dust like magic, soothes your tender skin, and leaves you feeling as refreshed and relaxed as a soft breeze on a summer's day. No wonder mothers love to bathe baby in swan suds. Mild, pure swan is so gentle and safe. It's ideal for even delicate fabrics. And as for dishes, why, when free sudsing swan goes into action in your dishpan, dirt and grime just seem to disappear. So switch to swan today for all your washing chores. Remember, it's the newer, better white floating soap with that wonderful free sudsing action for face, hands, bath, and dishes. Les Brown and his band, ladies and gentlemen. You know, Capitol Records has just released a platter of this number by Maggie Whiting and yours truly. And here now to give it the swan touch is our Doris Day, ladies and gentlemen. Just a bungalow for two, so right for each other. We won't need a view, we'll see one another. No glamour around us. But aren't you glad we found her? Mm. Mm. Lucky Lucky us. Though we haven't got a maid, they're so interesting. 
When we pull the shade, who's seeing, who's hearing? You can lose a glow. Our happiness is showing. Be lucky us. If we had a million, we might want a billion and be uneasy on our throne. But with love beside us, we're richer than Midas. Meet the royal family, John. You know, I'll come home from work at night. We'll kiss in the doorway. Check eyes so shiny bright to welcome me your way. So happy, so humble, too much in love to grumble. Mm. Lucky I'm. The rich pearly oysters. Who cluster in cloisters can never see beyond their rock. You can't see the bank book and gold has a blank look. Who, Who could live in love this fort now? But Al Jolson. You know, there'll be facts and things to men. I'll keep you in chicken. Oh, that's a joke. Time is all we'll spend with us. Time is riches. So happy with all things. Well, folks, we all know that Christmas shopping costs money. So before Bob started out with his list, he stopped in at the bank. We now find him talking to the manager. Oh, I wouldn't take up your time like this, Mr. Brooke, but I'm an old customer of the bank, and this is a very important matter. Very well. Sit down, and I'll see that we're not disturbed. Uh, Miss Mullins, cancel my long-distance call to the Bank of England. Tell General Motors I'll be late for the conference and call Harry at Blair House and tell him we'll have to discuss that billion-dollar loan later. And see that I'm not disturbed. I have a very important meeting. Now, Mr. Hope, what is it you wish to see me about? Well, your calendar came, and I don't like it. <laughs> Do you mean to tell me you interrupted my business day for that? I don't like the calendar, that's all. I don't like it. <laughs> Even my grocery store gives me one with a picture of a gorgeous petty girl in a negligee. Who wants to see Grandma Moses in a bare midriff? <laughs> Grandpa Moses. <laughs> now get out of here and don't bother me. You get out with that egg, will you, please? <laughs> well... I'm almost up to the teller's window. It sure was a long way. May I help you? Yes. Are those real $1,000 bills? That's there? right. Gee, is that stack over there real $5,000 bills? And are those $10,000 bills? Yes. Gee, what beautiful money. Would you mind stepping back, please? I'm going to close now, and I don't want to shut the window on your eyeballs. <laughs> well, how do you like that guy shutting the window before I got a good look? But I can't get over that picture on a $10,000 bill. I can understand why Alexander Hamilton is on there, but why should he have his arm around Jack Benny? <laughs> well, I better go over to the department store. I have to meet Doris. Oh, gee, Bob, this store is certainly crowded. Yeah, but I'm enjoying it. This is an interesting counter. And here's a present that would be just perfect for Crosby. A money belt with little suspenders around it. That's the lingerie department. <laughs> well, I don't know about those things. I've never seen an unabridged Sears Roebuck catalog. Oh, Bob, look, have you seen these new personality dolls? They're made to look just like celebrities. Yeah, I know. Have you seen this one of Margaret Truman? It's great. You just press a button and it leaves on a concert tour. <laughs> And have you seen the one of me, Doris? You? Yeah, since my latest picture, they brought out a great lover doll. You should see me as a little doll. I walk and talk and I even make love, just like in real life. Huh? Yeah, of course, you have to wind me up. Yeah, just like in real life. <laughs> Doris, jukebox Jenny. <laughs> Come over here. Yes, Bob. Where did you get that joke? I got it from Les Brown. Don't you think he should be a gag writer? I don't know. Let's wait and see how they classify him at the unemployment office. 
But Doris, let's go to the gift wrap counter and see if our... Well, Doris, hello, Mr. Ryan. Well, Miss Ryan. Well, how are you? Did you see that? Goodness, Mr. Hope, I've never been so upset in my whole life. I should never go out in crowds like this. Now, you are a little frail for it. Yes, I am. I should have known an accident would happen, and it did, too. The crowd pushed me, and I backed into one of those pneumatic suction tubes. <laughs> The next thing I knew, the cashier was poking around in my mouth for loose chains. <laughs> my, Miss Ryan, your hair certainly looks different. Well, it ought to. I had to wait till they brought it back to me from the mezzanine. <laughs> Have you finished your shopping, Mr. Holmes? Well, everything but my Aunt Alice is present. I was thinking of buying her a pair of stockings, but I don't know her size. Well, uh, her legs anything like mine? No, hers go straight up and down. <laughs> This is a jazzy joke. That's cute. Yeah, all right. I'm so happy, Mr. Hope. I bought all my gifts this year, and I still have enough money to buy a dress for myself. Oh, how nice. Miss Ryan, why don't you spend the money for a formal, a strapless evening gown? I oh, know. <laughs> strapless gowns on me are confusing. <laughs> They're confusing? Yes. Yeah. On me, you can't tell whether it's a skirt that crept up too high or a sweater that slid down too high. <laughs> Boulevard, beautiful, Bob. Yeah, those Christmas trees really put you in the right mood. I'm really loaded with Christmas spirit. Oh, Bob, look, there's a Santa Claus ringing his bell. Yeah, Doris, let's stop and cheer him up. Hello, Santa. Merry Christmas. What's merry about it, boy? <laughs> My feet are killing me, and this California sunshine is giving me fog poisoning. <laughs> I wish I was out in Beverly Hills. The Santa Claus is out there have suits made out of mink trimmed with ermine. Well, where'd you get that suit you're wearing? You'd be surprised what you can do with a bottle of ketchup and some long underwear. <laughs> oh, things are miserable. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs> Toss something in the tambourine, boy. You really need a battle? You wouldn't believe it if you could see the broken down shack my wife and I live in. Oh, sounds awful. Oh, it is. <laughs> the mice come in, take a look at us, and then send swan lappers to care. <laughs> well, gee, I feel sorry for you, Santa. Oh, you ain't heard the half of it, boy. We got thrown out of there. We wouldn't have any place to sleep at all if it wasn't for a friendly cab driver. You mean you sleep right oh, in yeah, the... Yeah. Fortunately, my wife has the kind of a head that fits right into the glove compartment. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs> Toss something in the tambourine, boy. Bob, I wouldn't give him anything. He sounds phony. Yeah, why should I give you any money? How do I know it's a legitimate cause? Oh, now you've hurt Santa's pride, boy. And I call you boy purely on speculation. <laughs> All this money will be used honestly. Bob, I'm sure he's not an authentic Kris Kringle. You should have seen me a couple of weeks ago. The department store furnished me with a real live reindeer. Well, where's the reindeer now? Well, it disappeared. And you know something? The manager of the department store accused me of eating it. It was a preposterous accusation. Well, did you deny it to the manager? Oh, yes. And I think I would have convinced him of my innocence, but I was picking my teeth with the antlers at the time. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everybody. Swan wrappers from America mean soap for your lips needy. Only 25 care swan days left. Send your swan wrappers to care, Boston 1, Massachusetts. And now we have a message from Rome, Italy. To hear from the Marchesa Maria Teodoli, national president of Goccia di Latte, an organization whose famous milk bars in Rome provide much-needed milk every morning of the year for over 3,000 undernourished Italian children. Ladies and gentlemen, Marchesa Teodoli. I'm very grateful, Mr. Hope, for this chance to thank you and all our American friends for the generous gifts of swim soap you have been sending to our needy boys and girls for your great care organization. If you could just visit our country long enough to see with your own eyes the smiles of pleasure 
your soap brings to the faces of these youngsters. You would feel even more keenly what a wonderful job you are doing to help ease the tragic after effects of war. Unfortunately, this distressing soap shortage isn't confined to Italy alone. It is all over Europe. The need is desperate everywhere, so keep up your good work by all means and help make this Christmas a truly clean Christmas for every needy child in Europe. For doing that, I humbly thank all of you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, Marquesa Teodori. Yes, swan wrappers from America mean soap for Europe's needy. Only 25 care swan days left. Send your swan wrappers to Care, Boston 1, Massachusetts. You can collect swan wrappers on your own or as a member of a group or organization. But man, woman, or child, whoever you are, wherever you may be, your help is needed. And your help, however small, will count, too. Because every two swan wrappers you mail into care means another bar of soap for the needy children of Europe. So don't delay. Send in your swan wrappers now. And keep sending them in as fast as you can collect them to care, Boston 1, Massachusetts. Remember, only 25 care swan days left. <laughs> Look, buddy, can't you read the sign? Nobody is allowed backstage here at NBC without a pass. You ain't got a pass, so you can't go in. Now, get out of here, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Benny, Jack Benny. <laughs> Jack Benny? Hey, you're the guy that went over to the other network, huh? Yes, yes. And now you come back here and you want to go inside. Boy, you got guts. <laughs> I've got a general electric blanket, too. <laughs> now, look. Listen, Mr. Benny, I really can't let you in without a pass. Mr. Hope will be through with his broadcast in a few minutes. Why don't you have a seat and wait? Well, thank you. All right. Dum 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 L S M S T Dum 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 Gosh, being back here at NBC gives me such a nostalgic feeling. It's almost like coming home. I had so many wonderful times here. Gee, I wish they could afford me. <laughs> well, the old place hasn't changed a bit. I used to sit in this very same seat and wait for Mary. I used to walk through that door every Sunday. And look, there's a payphone I used to call home after each broadcast. Hmm, I wonder... Hmm, my string is still here, but somebody took the nickel. <laughs> yeah, I wonder... Oh, here comes Hope down the hall. My, how he's aged. <laughs> Look at those bags under his eyes. He looks like a young Fred Allen. <laughs> no, he looks more like an old Fred Allen. What's the difference? Even a young Fred Allen looks like an old Fred Allen. <laughs> Just can't get over how awful Bob looks, huh? Hey, Mr. Holt, there's somebody here to see you. There is? Oh, Jack. Jack Benny. Oh, how are you, Bob? Gee, you look wonderful. <laughs> hmm. Jack, why didn't you come backstage to see me? Well, I wanted to, Bob, but this man behind the desk wouldn't let me through. I couldn't let him through, Mr. Hope. He didn't have a pass. Oh, he just sore because I went over to CBS. <laughs> Shouldn't have said that word, Jack. Now we'll all be on bread and water for 30 days. <laughs> Say, look, Charlie, anytime Mr. Benny wants to see me, he doesn't need a pass. I was just doing my job, Mr. Hope. You know the stumble bums we get backstage here? <laughs> How do I know he just wasn't trying to peddle Christmas cards? Oh, the very idea. Jack Benny peddling Christmas cards. <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous? Tell him, Jack. 
Well, go ahead, Jack. Tell him. Okay, I'll take a half a dozen green ones. Thank you. And, Bob, if you want to buy any of those rubber circus animals, be sure to give me a call. Rochester's at home blowing them up right now. <laughs> well, let's not talk to you, Jack. Come on back to my dressing room. Okay. Well, make yourself comfortable, Jack. Fine, I'll just sit in this chair. Here. Oh, now, wait a minute. I always sit in that chair. But I'm sitting in it. All right, you face the mirror. <laughs> Can I get you something, Jack, a cigarette? No, no, thanks. I just finished one. Cup of coffee? Coffee? Gee, it's been weeks since I had a cup. <laughs> well, well, why? On account of the high prices? No. Well, it's not that, Bob. All right, then have a cup. Oh, how much? <laughs> It's free, Jack. And after you're through, I'll wrap up the grounds for you to take home. <laughs> They'll be delicious with your saratan. <laughs> well, tell me, Jack, what did you want to see me about? Well, I don't even like to bring this up, Bob, because it's probably an oversight on your part, but your new picture, The Great Lover, is doing so well, and since I was in the picture and more or less contributed to its success, uh, don't you think it's only fair that you, um, that is... Well, I mean, uh... What are you trying to say, Jack? Uh, toss something in the tambourine, boy. <laughs> well, what do you mean? Well, after all, when you called me in to save... Uh, to appear in your picture, I thought there was money involved. Well, there was. You cost Paramount thousands. Remember that week we had to stop shooting so you could go up to Fresno and pick up a few bucks during the great crushing season? <laughs> Well, 30 cents an hour is nothing to sneeze at, you know. No, and with that stain on your feet, you won't have to buy socks for a year. <laughs> hmm. There's a nice line for a guest star. Hmm. <laughs> you played it well. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> I can't think of another word. <laughs> I can, but you can't do it. <laughs> now, come on. I have hey, to go Roberto. pretty low to top that. Come what are you saying? Get out of Stromboli. Neither give me a joke pretty soon or give me my money, will you? <laughs> oh, forget it, Jack. Forget it. A man my age has to start thinking about money. After all, when you get to be 39, you know, you're... Earning power is cut down a bit. How old are you? 39. Going on 38. <laughs> oh, that's what I like about you, Jack. You don't keep changing your age. You get one you like and stick to it. Yeah. <laughs> well, Bob, I hate to compromise, but if you'll pay me the money, I'll play one of the songs from your picture on my show next week. Well, which one? Well, how about a thousand violins I've been uh, practicing with? You have? Yes, I have my violin right here. I'll show you. Uh, let me get it out. Jack, is that a tin cup in your case? Yes, I keep my rods in it. <laughs> and get your foot off that dime. <laughs> okay, let's hear you play a thousand violins. Okay. Just want to warm up a little bit. I got so much talent, it scares me, you know? <laughs> scares me, too. <laughs> okay, anytime, Evelyn. <laughs> So far, Bob. Sounds like something the mule train left behind. <laughs> you know, he's right. I'm a jackass for coming over here. <laughs> you played it well. <laughs> now, wait a minute. That's not in the song. That's not in the song. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute!
What do you say, Bob? Do I get the money? Jack, stop talking about the money. Tell you what I'll do. I'll put it in the bank for you. It'll accumulate interest, and someday you'll have a nice nest egg. A nest egg? Look, great lover, I'm a working man, not an Easter bunny. <laughs> Bob, I was depending on that money to buy Christmas presents. Really? Yes, I was just making up my list. I had to get presents for Mary and her father and mother, her sister Babe and her brother, and something for Dennis and Phil and Don and Rochester. Well, gee, how much do you need? Mm, give me five dollars and we'll call it. <laughs> For the memory. That's it, huh? I want to thank Jack Bennett very much and also Lucky Strike. Thanks, Jack, for the memory of a swell evening. And I want to say thanks to that big and big hearted state of Texas and that Titanic Texan, Monty Moncrief and Eamon Carter, for the memory of the big milk fun show in Fort Worth last week. And thanks to Notre Dame and Southern Methodists for the memory of that all American thriller in the Cotton Bowl. Brother, that one made history. In fact, the Lone Star State is now rewriting a history book to read Remember the Alamo and Never Forget SMU versus Notre Dame. It was one of the greatest exhibitions of college spirit of this or any year. And another wonderful example of college spirit is the Living War Memorial Fund of the University of Southern California. You know, each year on the Trojan campus, an organization of student veterans, Trovets they're called, put on a drive to raise funds for scholarships for the children and their buddies who didn't come back. Good luck, Trovets. Believe me, no touchdown drive can ever equal yours. Good night, folks. Let's get those Christmas packages in the mail early. Let's give our pal the mailman a break. Don't break his back. Good night. <laughs> that girl everyone's raving about. She found her own rave number on the dial away chart. Now she's my number one rave. She's my sweet, sweet heart. Rave and only Rave Home Permanent brings you the easy-to-use dial away chart to end guesswork in home waving. A flick of your finger and there's your rave number, your personal guide to the perfect wave for your kind of hair. So fast, yet so sure... Rave Home Permanent gives you exactly the amount of curl you want. Long-lasting, yet more natural from the very first day. Coming up, it's Fibber McGee and Molly on NBC. Tom Hope will make you laugh every day in the Los Angeles Examiner. <laughs> well, hello. Come right in. Oh, George, we've got company. <laughs> This is Bill Goodwin, speaking for Lever Brothers, makers of Swan, the new white floating soap that's pure as fine Castile. Well, it's Tuesday night again, time for another pleasant visit with George Burns and Gracie Allen, our guests, Jack Benny, Jimmy Cash, Felix Mills and his orchestra, and the Swan Test. And now, meet the people who live in the Burns house, George and Gracie. Well, it's morning in the Burns home, and George is just coming downstairs to leave for the office. Good morning, dear. Good morning, darling. Look what the postman just brought you. A present from Pat O'Brien. Oh. I'll bet Pat Asari started that rumor about me being a juggler. Open the package, dear. All right. I met him yesterday, and I told him a few jokes. I guess that convinced him I was a comedian. <laughs> what, uh, what are you laughing about? What's in the package? A set of Indian clubs. <laughs> <laughs> Next time I get my hands on that oh, Irishman, dear, believe oh, me. George. Before long, everybody will know that you're not a juggler. They'll know you for what you really are. And, uh, what, uh, what is that? Well, a singer, of course. Oh, oh that. Oh, sure. I-, I wrote to our sponsor and suggested that you sing on our program every week. That's the twelfth time. Yeah, but this time he answered. Say, that's a good sign. Open the letter. Mm, wait till Bing Crosby hears you sing. He'll retire and start to raise a family. <laughs> Oh, Gracie, I'm not better than Crosby. As good, maybe, but, uh, well, <laughs> open the letter. What does the sponsor say? Believe me, there are plenty of other big programs that would like to have George Burns as a singer. Gracie, the letter, open it. Well? George, what are some of the other big programs? <laughs> Turn me down again, huh? Oh, I... never mind, dear. You're a great singer. Even Bill Goodwin said, with, with a voice like yours, you ought to sing in our big army show. Army show? Yes, it's in charge of some officer named Major Bose. 
I'll forget it. <clears throat> I better get along to the office. Yeah, I'll ride down in the bus with you. I have an appointment at the beauty shop. Okay, let's go. No way. Uh, before we leave, won't you sing something just for me? Oh, Grace. Oh, please, dear. Just one little glorious burst of melody. Well, all right. <clears throat> just to jiggle old. Everywhere I go, people know the part I'm playing. Oh, oh. God, you're wonderful. I won't be happy until your voice leaves the whole world the way it leaves me, weak and limp. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, come on, I'm due at the beauty shop in five minutes. What will it be today, Mrs. Burns? A shampoo and set? Oh, yes, and I'm kind of in a hurry, Josie. Well, I'll do my best, Mrs. Burns, but we're shorthanded, and I have to work on the customer in the next booth, too. The old horse face, I hope he chokes. He? You mean there's a man in the next booth? Well, sort of a man. Josie, where are you? Oh, that's him. I wish he'd go sit on a hot curling iron. Josie, come back here. This finger wave of mine stinks. <laughs> Awfully familiar. I wonder who. Josie, do you hear me? This finger wave stinks. All right, all right. Leave your hair on the table and I'll do it over again. <laughs> no, Josie. I'm sure I know that man. What's his name? I'm not allowed to tell, Mrs. Burns. The old goat scared the newspapers might find out he goes to a beauty shop. Oh, come on, Josie. Give me a little hint. Well, he's the stingiest man in Hollywood. Oh. Huh? And how? When he gets a mud pack, we have to save the mud for him so he can put it in his victory garden. <laughs> Funny. I can't get it from that. Give me another hit. Well, let's see. Um, uh, he used to drive an old broken down Maxwell. Uh, no, it's no use. I can't guess who it is. <laughs> You're not missing anything. He's tried to date every girl in town, and nobody will go out with him. Oh. Oh, hello, Jack. How's Mary? <laughs> Gracie, is that you? Well, yeah, come on into my booth, Jack. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> oh. Hello, Gracie. I guess you're surprised to see me here. Well, yes, I am. Well... You see, Mary lost her bobby pin the last time she was here. I, I dropped by to look for it. <laughs> you know what the bobby pin situation is terrible. Oh, sure. I bet you thought I was here to get a beauty treatment. <laughs> Gracie, you sound like you don't believe me. <laughs> Maybe that's because I don't. <laughs> Well, if I'm lying, may something terrible happen to Phil Harris. <laughs> oh, uh, Mr. Benny. Yes? Here's your mud. I wrapped it up for you. <laughs> oh, well. Phil always played too loud anyway. <laughs> well, just Benny in a beauty shop. <laughs> Wait till the girls hear this. Now, Gracie, look. Listen, you must oh, promise girls, me. I brought your swan soap. Oh, hello, Gracie. Oh, hello, Bill. Why, Jack Benny. What are you doing here? Well, I'll tell you, Bill. He's well, a... Bill Goodwin in a beauty shop. <laughs> Wait till the girls hear this, huh, Gracie? Wait a minute. I just came over to bring some swan soap. Well, Bill, I... Oh, Bill Goodwin has beauty treatments. That's really something to tell the girls, huh, Gracie? Hey, look. The operators here use swan soap. Not only because it's so mild for the customer's complexion, but because that same mildness makes it great at home. The dishes, light laundry, or for bathing the baby. Swan's a new white floating soap that's four swell soaps in one. Well, Bill, 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 Bill Goodwin in a beauty shop. <laughs> really, I, I thought that curly hair wasn't natural. Yeah. Now, wait a minute. No girl in this shop has ever laid a hand on me. Except, of course, after working hours. <laughs> oh. What are you doing here, Benny? Oh, well, I'll tell you, Bill. Jack is saying... Bill Goodwin in a beauty <laughs> I'm getting manicures and everything. I am not. My hands just happen to look gorgeous because I always wash my dishes with Swan. Oh. Swan is great for washing the dishes. Gives you loads of suds. 
suds that are so mild and gentle, your hands don't get that rough red dish panty look. Well, Bill, Bill! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a good one in a beauty shop. And a happy... And to have his eyebrows plucked, that's something. Isn't now, it? look, Jack, I told you, I just came here to deliver some swan soap. Swan's a great wartime buy. What I want to know is, what's Jack Benny doing here? Well, I'll tell you, Bill. Where are you? Bill, go all nuts. Goodbye. <laughs> Gracie, Gracie, look, for heaven's sake, don't let out my secret. I mean, I don't want everyone I meet to know I've been taking beauty treatments. Oh, don't worry, Jack. You'll never suspect it. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, don't you tell. You know, if the newspapers get hold of it, I'm cooked. And you know how the gang would kid me on my program. Oh, yeah, your program. Uh, Jack, you don't want this to get in the papers, huh? No, I- I'll do anything to keep it out, Gracie, anything. Oh, good. Uh, starting Sunday, Jack, George will sing on your program. <laughs> George? Yes. Sing? Uh-huh. Gracie, I've heard prettier noises come out of Carmen Lombardo. <laughs> I see. Well... Excuse me, Jack. I'm going to telephone a little news item to the paper. Wait, wait. Oh, you mean George Bird? Yes. Oh, George, your husband. Yes. Oh, old sugar throw. George. Oh. Oh, well, I, I don't suppose it would hurt if George sang on my program once. Well, I was thinking of having him sing every week. No, no, no. No, well, I'll call the paper. But, Gracie, this is blackmail. <laughs> I know. Cue to me, huh? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, cute, cute. Right. The one Ted joins our popular tenor, Jimmy Cash, in an enchanting ballad from the top musical show of the year, Oklahoma. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. I got a beautiful feeling, everything's going my way. There's bright golden haze on the meadow. There's a bright golden haze on the meadow. On in the sky as an elephant fly. And it looks like it's climbing clear up to the sky. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. I got a beautiful feeling. Everything's going my way. Okay. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. Benny is pleading with Gracie to change her mind as they wait for George to come home from the office. But but why does it have to be my program, Gracie? I mean, why don't you have George sing on Eddie Cantor's program? Well, because I didn't catch Eddie Cantor in a beauty shop with his toupee and collars. <laughs> hey, there must be some other show he can go on. Maybe maybe Gabriel Heater needs a sing. <laughs> or Mr. Anthony. I mean, why don't you let George be his problem? Oh, uh, you, you amaze me. How can Jack Benny, who has the greatest talent in the world, fail to recognize George's talent? Oh, 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 do you really think I have the greatest talent in the world? Well, certainly. Rochester, Dennis Day, Mary Livingston. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. And now I've got a big thrill for you. I have your program for next Sunday night all planned. You have? Yes. It'll be the new and entertaining Jack Benny program featuring George Burns, California's answer to Frank Sinatra. I, 
Look, I, I can't do it, Gracie. I mean, I can't allow George to sing. George, shall I call the papers and tell them about the beauty shop? He sings, he sings. <laughs> now, listen to the way I have the program all worked out. You're the star, so of course you come out first. Thank you. Your line is, hello. And then George comes out for his opening number. I just say hello. <laughs> well, we could make it hello, everybody. No, no, I don't want to hog the whole show. <laughs> Well, then George sings his second number, and back you come again. Good. To announce George's next number. I hope my throat stands up. <laughs> and then right after that, Dennis Day comes in. Dennis Day? Yes. Well, doesn't George do all the singing? Well, yes, but I thought you might want a few laughs on the program. Oh, yeah, I'll be glad to have them. I will. Yeah, yeah. Then as soon as George finishes his next number, I'll come... Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Gracie, George can't sing the whole program. I mean, he's not that good. I know music, you know. I'm a musician. You are? Well, I play the violin, don't I? <laughs> well, don't I? <laughs> You're cute. <laughs> Look, Gracie, all oh, that I'm... Why, Jack Benny. Hello, George. How's the juggling game? <laughs> I'm not a juggler. Why doesn't everybody stop with that? Oh, now, dear, don't get excited. Jack has some marvelous news for you. Tell him, Jack. Yeah. I think I'll go call the papers. All right, all right. I'll tell them. Oh, good. I'll run out and make some coffee. Hello, Jack. How is it you want to tell me? Well, first, first, I'd like to remind you that you're my dearest friend, George. And you're my dearest friend, Jack. I mean, you're even more than a friend to me, George. You're even more than a friend to me, Jack. <laughs> I love you. I love you like a brother, George. I love you like a brother, Jack. I mean, I'd never do anything to hurt you, George. Thanks. Wait a minute, I'll try that again. <laughs> I'd never do anything to hurt you, George. I said thanks. George, look, I mean, I wouldn't louse you up if you had a comedy program. If I had a comedy program... <laughs> I mean, look, you're my dearest look, friend. Look, Jack, wh what's the news, I Jack? I mean, you're even more than the, a friend the, to me. The news, Jack. Look, what's the news? What pals we've always said. Uh, the news, Jack. You have some news for me. Look, remember the time in Cincinnati when you were broke and I gave you $10? It was Cleveland, Jack, and I gave you $20. <laughs> well, I have the state right. It was Ohio. <laughs> yeah, the news, Jack. What's this news you have for me? Well, yes. Well, dear, did Jack tell you the news? No, not yet. He's been he's been leading up to it by the way of Cleveland, Cincinnati. <laughs> Jack, I'll bet little Abner won't be the funniest thing in the paper tomorrow. <laughs> oh, all right, George. Look, I want you to sing on my radio program. Why, Jack Benny? Now, now, don't really? be hasty, George. I mean, don't don't jump at it. Uh, think it over for the duration. <laughs> I don't have to. I'll sing a dozen songs for you, pal, and it won't cost you a cent. For free? Sure. No, no, no. no, no. I, I can't think of it that way. Well, all right, then you can pay me. No, I can't think of it that way either. <laughs> I know what's making Jack hesitate, dear. He hasn't heard you sing recently. Sing ain't misbehaving for him. Sure, glad to. Well, sit down, Jack. No, I'll take it standing up. <laughs> now, come on, dear. No one to talk with all by myself. No one to walk with, I'll have to be on the show. Hey, misbehaving, saving all my love for. Oh, baby, love you. Really saving love for you. <laughs> he doesn't juggle at all. <laughs> no. I know for certain you're the one I love. I'm through with flirting. It's you that I'm thinking of. Hey, misbehaving, saving all my love for. Oh, baby, my love for you. Jack, what makes you think he's a juggler? He must be. <laughs> Jackie Horner, in the corner, don't go nowhere. And I don't care for all your kisses that you gave me, baby. Daddy, daddy, daddy. I might be blood and guts, but that's just guts. <laughs> Stay out late and I don't care to go. I'm home about it. 
me in the radio. Hey, Miss Behaven, saving all my love for you. Well, Jack? Gracie, call the newspaper. <laughs> Time for Felix Mills and his orchestra. Tonight, from Felix's memory album, it's Honeysuckle Rose. the impression that Jack Benny didn't like my singing. Oh, George, that's silly. Didn't you hear him tell me to call the newspapers? He wants to give them a big story about you. Yeah, but I noticed that while I was singing, he, he kind of turned green. Oh, well, of course, of course he turned green. You sang exactly like John McCormick. Oh, so that's what well, it was. Well, sure. Now, I'll go in and talk to Jack. You stay here and spray your precious little ad night. Okay. From time to time and every time... Jack. Yeah? Well, naturally, you were joking before when you told me to call the newspapers, weren't you? Not me, Gracie. Look, I'd rather have everybody know I was in a beauty shop than have sugar throat smell up my program. <laughs> well, I'm warning you. I'll phone the paper. Phone them. This is my last warning, Jack. Go ahead. I'll phone the paper. Phone them. This is my last warning, Jack. <laughs> Go ahead. I'll phone the paper. Phone them. This is my last warning, Jack. Go ahead. I'll phone the paper. For Pete's sake, phone them. No, Jack, no, I can't. I'm too fine, too decent. I can't stoop to blackmail when I see it isn't working. <laughs> now, now, please, don't think I'm a heel, Gracie. I'm, gee, I'm kind of animals. I'm fond of children. But I, I just don't like George's voice. Oh, you're fond of children, huh? I love them. <sighs> Poor little Junior. Poor little who? Junior. He'd be so proud if he knew that his daddy had sung on the Jack Benny program. Gracie, you mean... Yes. George and I are parents now. He's the father and I'm the mother. <laughs> Gee whiz, I, I can't believe it. How, when did it happen? Well, I don't remember exactly. We were so excited at the time. <laughs> well, I'll be darned. Good old George has a baby. It hardly seems possible. Yes. I was amazed when George told me. <laughs> I just can't get over it, Gracie. I'm so happy for you. So happy for George. Who does the kid look like? Like me. I'm so happy for the kid. <laughs> Say, could I, could I see him? I'm crazy about kids. Really, Dad? Oh, sure. I mean, many, many of the time I bought a bag of candy and blew up the bag to amuse a kid. <laughs> Imagine good old George, your father. Well, you can do something awfully nice for Junior. Let his father sing on your program. 
Gracie, I'm mad about children. Now, that... please, Jack. The baby adores you. When you're on the air, he lies in his crib gurgling with his little foot in his mouth. When Fred Allen's on, he puts his foot in his ear. <laughs> you what a smart little rascal. Oh, I, I know you'll do it for Junior. I can look in your sensitive blue eyes and tell that you won't disappoint him. They are blue, aren't they? Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, George can sing one song just for the baby. Well, let him sing two songs. We're expecting another one. <laughs> really? Yes. Good old George. <laughs> did, did I hear somebody call me? No, we were talking about you. Gracie told me everything. Congratulations, George. You mean I can sing a song on your program? Yes, sir. You deserve it. Gracie tells me there's going to be another one. Well, two would be fine if it's all right with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, why not? Have you picked out a name for the second one? Would you like Moon Glow? <laughs> Moon Glow Burns. <laughs> won't, look, won't that be just a little too corny? Oh, I don't think so, Jack. You know, while you were away, I took a few lessons from Crosby. <laughs> You did? Yes. Now, George, I know Jack's in a hurry. Yeah, yes, I'll be going. But, George, first, can I see the nursery? Well, Jack... The nursery? Hi, what? folks. What goes on? Oh, Bill, am I glad to see you. Bill, I just heard the news. Now, why didn't you tell me that George and Gracie had yeah, a... Yeah, yes, Bill. Oh, why didn't you tell Jack what George and I had? Well, what did you have? An idea for you to announce Jack's program, and George sings on it. Huh? But I... Oh, never... well, that's a great idea, Jack. I'd be glad to. Now, wait a minute. I have an announcer, Don Wilson. Well, okay. You can have two announcers. Don Wilson is two announcers. <laughs> but Don can't announce your program, Jack. He doesn't know anything about Swan Soap. Swan Soap? Well, sure. He doesn't know that Swan is the new white floating soap that's four soaps in one. The soap for dishes, light laundry, bathing the baby, or for your hands and face. Don doesn't know that. Well, I could teach him. I mean, what am I saying? I don't sell soap. I... I sell grape nuts flakes. Well, but, but that's ridiculous, Jack. Can you bathe the baby with grape nuts flakes? <laughs> well, I wouldn't want to answer that until I've talked to my sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can... They're very resourceful, you know. Well, I they can... They may be working on that right now. <laughs> well, I can tell you the doctors recommend Swan for bathing the baby. Swan is so mild it's kind even to a little baby's tender skin. Pure as fine Castile, too, so you know it must be great for your complexion. Gee, bathing a baby. You ever bathe that little darling of yours, George? Don't be silly. We take showers. <laughs> uh-huh. Boy, he, he means us. But the swan is great for bathing the baby. Oh, yes, and Gracie breaks it in two, so she... Can... Breaks it in two? <laughs> Well, sure, Jack. Swan breaks in two, so you can use half in the kitchen for your dishes and light laundry and half in the bathroom for the baby or for your tub or shower. Oh, well, look, Bill, don't bother to tell me about Swan so because I'm just using George on my program, not you. You see, I'm only doing it for Junior. Junior? Well, yes, George. That's what Jack calls you because you're so much younger than Jack. <laughs> no, no, look, I mean the baby. The baby? Well, yeah, yes, that's what he calls me because... I'm so much younger than you. No, Gracie, look, I'm talking about your child. Child? Well, goodbye, Jack. See you at rehearsal Sunday. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Gracie, what does he mean, our child? Oh, dear. I knew there was something I forgot to tell you. <laughs> we haven't got a child. You. Well, so that's it, Gracie. Just to get George on my program, you invented a baby. Oh, no, I can't take credit for that. They were invented years ago. <laughs> Don't try to get out of it. I don't want to sing on the radio if I have to get on by tricks. Now apologize to Jack. I'm sorry, Jack. And don't ever do a thing like that again. I won't do it. Ever, understand? Yes, sir. Come on, Jack. I'll walk you down to the corner. My goodness, George, what you go through with a thing. Hello? Hello, Pippa? This is Gracie. 
Oh, would you and Molly let George sing your program next week? Yeah, I know you've got to sing it, but I thought you might do it for Junior. Yes, you see, he's just had a baby. And he's so fun. I'm just going to be here long enough to remind you that the government needs your waste kitchen fat more than ever before. Now, I know sometimes it's a lot of trouble to render the extra fat you trim from meat and to strain all your waste fat from roasting and frying. Those waste fats are so urgently needed for making glycerin. That glycerin is so necessary for making ammunition that I know you won't mind doing whatever you can. So don't forget, huh? Turn those waste fats into your butcher and keep turning them in. Well, here they are again, those ever-loving birds. It's George and Grace. Well, George, I've got some wonderful news. Little McGee wants you to sing on his program. Really? Yes. And um, when he comes over to close the deal, would you try to fold this napkin into a triangle? What? Ah, uh, well, for some silly reason, he thinks we have a baby. Again? Good night, Good night. Good night. The Swan, the new white voting show. Join George and Gracie in inviting you to tune in to your Columbia station again next week, same time. Don't forget, George Burns and Gracie Allen, CBS next Tuesday night. Now, till next week, this is Bill Goodwin saying, Well, I, Swan, how about you? Good night, everybody. Gentlemen, Colgate Dental Cream presents the new Dennis Day Show, written by Frank Galen, with Sharon Douglas, Dink Trout, John Brown, Elliot Lewis, Joe Forte, Charles Dent in the orchestra, yours truly, Vern Smith, and starring the popular singer of the Jack Benny Show in A Day in the Life of Dennis Day. Twice a day and before every date, use Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth. Here's Dennis to sing zippity doo da. Zippity doo da, zippity a. My oh my, what a wonderful day. Plenty of sunshine head my way. Zippity doo da, zippity a, Mr. Bluebird on my shoulder. It's the truth, it's actual. Everything is satisfactual. Zippity doo da, zippity a, wonderful feeling, wonderful day, Mr. Bluebird on. My shoulder, it's the truth, it's action, everything is satisfactual. Zippity doo da, zippity a, wonderful feeling. Colgate Dental Cream cleans your breath while it cleans your teeth. No other toothpaste does a better job of cleaning your teeth than Colgate Dental Cream. For Colgate Dental Cream has a safe polishing agent that cleans your teeth both gently and thoroughly, brings out their natural sparkle and beauty. And scientific tests prove that Colgate Dental Cream cleans your breath while it cleans your teeth. Yes, actual scientific tests prove conclusively that in 7 out of 10 cases... Colgate Dental Cream instantly stops unpleasing breath that originates in the mouth. Colgate Dental Cream is famous for its wonderful wake-up flavor, too. Nationwide tests of leading toothpastes 
prove that Colgate Dental Cream is preferred for flavor over other brands tested. So try Colgate Dental Cream to bring out the natural sparkle and beauty of your teeth for a wake-up flavor you'll thoroughly enjoy. And use Colgate Dental Cream twice a day and before every date to clean your breath while you clean your teeth. Well, as you know, Dennis Day rooms at the Anderson Boarding House in Weaverville, which is run, along with all its occupants, by Mrs. Anderson. But Mrs. Anderson isn't home this weekend. She's gone up to Middletown for the yearly pre-Thanksgiving pageant presented by the Middletown Little Theater League. Does Mr. Anderson miss his wife, you ask? Just listen. Well, it's nearly 8 o'clock, Mildred. Oh, I must be off for the lecture downtown. I... Oh, it should be, Daddy. When I dusted your dresser, I saw the name of the lecturer on the ticket. Mm -hmm. Tassel's Latour, the Platinum Ball of Fire. <clears throat> well, yes, sir. He's a very interesting speaker. <laughs> you know, you better not let Mother hear you've been to a burlesque show. Oh, I know. I nearly gave myself away last time she went up to Middleton, too. Really? Yes. When she came in the house and took off her hat and coat, I applauded. <laughs> But Mrs. Anderson wasn't the only Weaverville visitor at the Middletown pageant this year. There was also Dennis's boss, Mr. Willoughby. Mr. Willoughby, however, doesn't seem too happy about his trip. When I went away, I left Dennis in charge of the drugstore. For that, I ought to have my head examined. I hadn't been out of the place ten minutes before he even came in to see me. Of course, Dennis stepped right up. Good morning, sir. Uh, no, sir, he's away, but if I can help you, I... I'm sure you can, young man. I can see at a glance that you are bright and intelligent, a hustler and a go-getter with vision. In short, you are a man of distinction. Is that correct? No, sir, I never touch the stuff. <laughs> what I mean is, you're a man who knows a good proposition when he hears one. How much is your salary here? Eight dollars a week plus ten percent commission on everything I sell over my quota. I see. Then your salary and commission together come to... Eight dollars a week. <laughs> well, what would you think of a scheme that could raise that salary to twelve dollars a week? Maybe fourteen? Maybe even fifteen? Fifteen dollars a week? Little plan? No, sir. If there's that much money in it, it can't be honest. <laughs> oh, but it is, my friend. You see, I represent WEAV, Weaverville's new radio station. We can double this store's business overnight. And if Mr. Willoughby makes more money, you make more money. Your station can double our business? Certainly. You don't know the power of radio, my boy. Now, for instance, you listen to the Jack Benny program on your radio, don't you? Jack Benny? No, sir. You don't? No, sir. For some reason, I'm never home. <laughs> well, Jack Benny goes on the air every Sunday night and spells out LSMFT. LSMFT. Next day, millions of people go into stores and ask for the product. Really? I wouldn't even know how to pronounce it. <laughs> well, the point is we've signed up every progressive merchant in Weaverville for our opening program. Surely your boss wouldn't want to be left out. Oh, no, sir. Good. Here's a pen. Sign right here. Okay. There you are. Fine. You now have 15 minutes on Tuesday night to put on any sort of program you wish. Oh, thank you, sir. This is awfully nice of you. Not at all. Just tell your boss to mail his check to the station. His check? You mean you charge people to go on the radio? Certainly. Fifteen minutes comes to $150. You see, time on the air is very valuable property, and we... Say, were your eyes crossed like that when I came in? <laughs> you don't know my boss. You better give me back that oh, paper. Oh, no, this is a legal contract, pal. You can tell your boss about it. You'll be listening in on Tuesday night, of course. Yes, sir. If they have radios... That... Oh, my goodness, Dennis. $150? Uh-huh. Mr. Willoughby's going to raise the roof when he finds out, Mildred. But maybe a radio show isn't such a bad idea for the Finney has done for his sponsor. Yeah, but Mr. Willoughby doesn't feel the same way about money as Jack Finney's sponsor. He feels the same... <laughs> Golly, if we only had a good radio program to submit to Mr. Willoughby, he might put it on the air. Yeah, but where can we get one? You're going upstairs right now and write one. Me? Golly, Mildred, I couldn't write a radio program paper. 
Dennis, I'll get you paper. Now, write a dramatic show, like those morning serials, you know. Make it homey and sweet and down to earth, but original. Original? Yes. Don't do one about life. Uh Uh-huh. And another one is about a reporter, and there's one about an intern. You think of something that hasn't been done. Okay. Good morning, Dennis. Morning, Mr. Willoughby. Did you enjoy the pageant at Middletown? I hated it. If there's anything I detest, it's plays and actors. Yes, sir. How do you feel about radio, Mr. Willoughby? Radio? Really, sir? Yes, sir. I I turn it on all the time when I want to set my watch. <laughs> But if you had a radio program advertising your store, you could double your business. Radio programs cost money, Dennis. I consider spending money a nasty, dirty habit. (laughs) Well, this program wouldn't cost much, Mr. Willoughby. I wrote it myself. Already? (laughs) Oh, no, sir. My program is a dramatic morning serial. It's homey and down-to-earth, but different from anything on the air. Oh? Well, what's it called? Just plain Boris, King of Bulgaria. Huh? It's the story of a common, ordinary royal family. A king and queen who could be your neighbor or mine. <laughs> Thank you very much. I can do without it easily. But being a radio sponsor has a lot of advantages, Mr. Willoughby. No. Number one, you'll be known all over as a big executive. Number two, you'll be doing something creative. Number three, you'll, you'll, you'll get to meet some awfully nice actors and actresses. Number four, it'll help business. Hey, what was that last one? Number four? No, no, number three. Number three B. You mean about meeting actresses? That's the one. You detested actresses. I said actors. Actresses are built somewhat differently. Golly, you mean you will sponsor the radio program? Well, now, that depends on the cost. How much money will I have to spend? Ten dollars? Twenty dollars? Well, let's not discuss money. It's so sordid. Dennis, I've got to know how much this thing will cost. Well, so far, expenses are a hundred and fifty dollars. $150? Yes, sir, for the station. Couldn't you just rent a station? Did you have to buy one? (laughs) Oh, that's for the time. We've got to pay that because I signed the contract. They can sue you. Sue me, eh? I made a mistake. It could happen to anyone. (laughs) Oh, yes, yes. I've made mistakes, too. In fact, I guess once in my life I committed an unpardonable sin. You did, Mr. Willoughby? I must have done it. Why else would you be sent to work for me? Oh, but he was awfully mad. Oh, but he agreed to put on the show, huh? Well, he'll have to pay for the time, but how can I get actors for nothing? Oh, golly. Let's see now. If only Mr. Willoughby hadn't let me mind the store when he went to Middletown to see the little theater pageant, this would The Middletown have... little, little theater pageant, that's it. Again, I said something? (laughs) Sure, there are the actors for your program. But they wouldn't act for nothing. Well, they might for, we'll say, a big Hollywood producer. Where are we going to get a big Hollywood producer? We have one. You. Me? Yes. All you have to do is go over to Middletown and claim you're a big shot from Hollywood. Well, I'll try it. But I hope they don't notice my pants or they'll know I'm not from Hollywood. Your pants? What's the matter with your pants? They match my coat. Now, before we continue our story, here's Dennis Day singing Falling in Love with Love. Falling in love with love is falling for make-believe. Falling in love with love is playing fool. Caring so much is such a juvenile fancy. Learning to trust is just for children in school. I fell in love with love one night when the moon was full. I was unwise with eyes unable to see. I fell in love with love with love everlasting. I fell 
in love with love One night when the moon was full I was unwise with eyes Unable to see Now back to a day in the life of Dennis Day, who, in the guise of a big Hollywood film magnet, is about to knock on the door of the Middletown Little Theater League in an effort to get some actors to do his forthcoming radio. He got Mr. Anderson along with him as his guest man. Yes? How do you do, my good man? I'm Orson Metro Day, the big Hollywood producer from Hollywood. From Hollywood? Yes, it's located right near L.A., or as the tourists put it, Los Angeles. <laughs> We, we movie folks always call it L.A. Saves so much of our valuable time. Well, come in, gentlemen. Come in. Ah, but this is thrilling to think that a great Hollywood producer should call upon me, an humble actor who has gained undying fame on the stages of the world, who has appeared before the crowned heads of Europe, and who in 1928 received a write-up over three inches long in Variety. Uh, variety? The horse racing paper, old boy. Oh, <laughs> yes, O.D. Ah, how I envy you living in Hollywood, that fabulous land. I suppose you're at Grauman's Chinese all the time. Oh, yes, I wouldn't send my shirts anywhere else. <laughs> Your shirt? Well, uh, uh, Mr. Day is a little confused. Your town is quite a change after Hollywood. Oh, yes, it must be. Uh, Mr. Day, do you live near Beverly Hills? Oh, yes, indeed. Oh. <laughs> Hollywood, Mr. Day? Of course, my go. I was sitting in the brown derby with my feet in the cement. <laughs> well, Mr. Dizzy, is it a business call? Yes, my friend. I'm always in the market for talent. When I saw your pageant, I said to myself, there's the man for the new picture you're making at Goldwyn Studios. Or as I always call it, Sam's Place. <laughs> I'm very much flattered. However, I've been expecting a picture offer for some time. Naturally. Uh, <laughs> shall we discuss remuneration? Remuneration? He'd like to discuss remuneration, Anderson. Remuneration? Oh, yes, O.D. <laughs> I'm sorry, old man, but neither of us knows what it means. <laughs> well, it means salary, wages. Oh, that stuff. Oh, I'm sorry, but we couldn't possibly discuss that until after the radio tryout. The radio tryout? Yes, we want you and your entire troupe to act in a radio play as a sort of a test. For a very small sum, I suppose. Not quite that much. <laughs> For nothing? All Hollywood will be listening in, my boy. Your screen career will be in the balance. Oh, well. All right, I suppose I'll have to do it. Ah, good. Who knows where you may climb to if this is a hit? You may become a second Clark Gable. Another child Boyer. Bigger even than Lassie. <laughs> See, I hope so. Well, tonight's the big night, Dennis. Got your cast all lined up? Oh, yes, Mr. Willoughby. We're all ready to go. Good. Uh, I've been reading your script, and I took the liberty of making a few very minor changes. Just trivial things, you know. I hope you don't mind. Oh, no, sir. Now, for instance, you have the hero marrying Margaret at the end. I had him marry Geraldine. Is that all right? Well, I suppose so, although Geraldine is, is his sister. <laughs> uh, not anymore. I changed it so they hardly know each other. But they have to know each other. They live in the palace together. Oh, it isn't a palace now. It's a shoe factory. And Geraldine just works there. But it was in the palace that the Greek discovered the missing pearl in the royal chambers on Saturday morning. He finds it now in a sewer. Oh. Only it isn't a pearl, it's the Mona Lisa. And he isn't a Greek anymore, he's a Democrat. <laughs> More uh, 
uh, interesting, don't you think? Yes, sir. After all, they're only minor changes. It still takes place on Saturday morning. <laughs> yes, that's true. Did you make any other changes? Well, that's all, except for a small one on page 20. You know where the Russian comes in and says, Da. Yes, sir. You changed that line? Oh, no, no. No, that line is perfect. Oh, thank you, sir. I just cut out the rest of the page. <laughs> I, uh, I also put a new title on the story. I hope you don't mind these trivial little changes. Oh, no, sir. Well, I better get the fountain cleaned. We'll be on the air in an hour. Good evening, sir. I'd like some grease paint, please. Oh, my gosh. My star actor. The clerk will wait on you, sir. He's behind the soda house. Oh, very well. Clark, I'd like some grease paint, please. We haven't got any. Try down the street. Do you mind taking your head out of that ice cream can? I can't hear what you're saying. <laughs> Dennis, take your head out of the ice cream can. Yes, sir. That's better now. I... <laughs> you. Huh? Why, you're Austin Metro Day. Who? Oh, you must mean my uncle, Orson Day, the movie producer. Your uncle? You look exactly like him. Yeah, he's my twin uncle. <laughs> Mr. Day, don't be absurd. What are you doing back of that fountain with the white apron on? Well, I was making myself a marshmallow sundae. It's sort of a hobby of mine. Oh, I see. You Hollywoodians certainly are an eccentric lot. Yeah, aren't we, though? Dennis, you better let me handle this customer. It's getting late. You go in the back and sweep the place out. Sweep the place out? <laughs> yeah, I got all kinds of hobbies. And uh, while you're at it, don't forget to take out the garbage. Take out the garbage? I'll bet you won't find one man in ten with that one. <laughs> oh, Mr. Austin Metro Day of Hollywood, eh? And we were going to appear on your radio show tonight. A fat chance. But, sir, ah, I... Good day, Mr. Bye. <laughs> Mr. Bye? What was that all about, Dennis? Well, remember you made some slight changes in the script? Yes. Yeah. He just made some slight changes in the casting. Stand by with the Willoughby Drugstore program, folks. You're on in ten seconds. Golly, ten seconds. Gosh, Mr. Willoughby, what are we going to do? We have no actors. Dennis, this program is going on the air even if you have to play all the parts yourself. But, Mr. Willoughby... Oh, you can do it, Dennis. I'll play the girl's part and you play all the men. Oh, no, Mildred, I... You're I... on the air. Oh, Dennis, go ahead. Willoughby's Drugstore presents Zelda Popkin, Girl Good Humor Man. <laughs> The program that asks the question, can a woman marry for the third time and still be happy, even if her first two husbands remain in the house? <laughs> At last, Brunson Popkin has been discharged from the Navy. And now, after five long years of waiting and yearning, without even a glimpse of each other, Ronson stands upon the Popkin doorstep. Zelda speaks. Hello, Ronson. Hiya, Zelda. Dinner ready? <laughs> Almost. Uncle Ivanovich is here for dinner, too. Here he comes now. Say hello to him, Ronson. Hello, Uncle Ivanovich. But you have to play Uncle Ivanovich, too, Dennis. Speak with an accent. Hasta la vista, Senor Ronson. I'm glad to see you. <laughs> Dennis, Uncle Ivanovich is supposed to be from Moscow. Oh. I'm glad for to meet you, Gus. How are you? Is it? <laughs> Dennis, Moscow's in Russia. Oh. How do you do? <laughs> We have quite a crowd for dinner tonight, Ronson. Uncle Ivanovich brought our cousin Louis from the Bronx with him. I'm cousin Louis from the Bronx, too? Yes. Evening, folks. How are you all? <laughs> and look, Ronson, here comes Grandpa downstairs. Hello, Grandpa. Evening, Sonny. Sure, it's a mighty cold night. Yes, indeed, it sure is. Yes, sure, boy. Right. <laughs> with us, Patrolman O'Flaherty. Hello, Mr. O'Flaherty. Top of the evening to you there, Ronnie, me boy. Faith, and it's a fine night, it is indeed, and it's a grand night for a drop of the rain. <laughs> <laughs> I do the same. Why, Ronson, see who's coming up the walk. Oh, no, Mildred, I can't do that. But you've got to, Dan. Ronson, see who's coming up the walk. <laughs> You sit here, Mr. O'Flaherty. Sure thing, sport. I, I said Mr. O'Flaherty, Dennis. Oh, pardon me. 
Evening, folks. How y'all? Hello, Dennis. How do you do? Dennis. Oh, Dennis, you imbecile. Give me that script. I'll do it. Read your last line again, Mildred. Um, you sit here, Mr. O'Flaherty. Si, senor. We, monsieur. Hi, y'all. Won't mind here. Oh, shut up. Please, the music, somebody. Get us out of this. For heaven's sake. Dennis Day will return in a moment with a song, but first, here's a fact worth knowing. Colgate Dental Cream cleans your breath while it cleans your teeth. And now our Colgate players want to show you how important that is. Listen. It's just definitely not fair, Claire. I'm the one who writes the letters, and you're the girl who gets the mail. Maybe what you write is wrong. Do you really think that's the trouble? No. Truthfully, I don't bet. In fact, I know the reason why Dan hasn't written to you lately. And you haven't told me? Good grief. What am I? Not one of those girls who ought to see her dentist. Well, I think you'd see more letters from Dan if you'd see your dentist, Beth. And here's what Beth found out. Scientific tests have proved that in seven out of ten cases, Colgate Dental Cream instantly stops unpleasing breath that originates in the mouth. What's more, Colgate Dental Cream's safe polishing agent brings out the natural sparkle of your teeth, cleans them thoroughly and safely. Yes, Colgate Dental Cream cleans your breath. While it cleans your teeth. And Colgate Dental Cream is famous for its wonderful wake-up flavor, too. In fact, nationwide tests of leading toothpaste prove that Colgate Dental Cream is preferred for flavor over other brands tested. So, to clean your teeth thoroughly and safely, for a wake-up flavor everyone enjoys, use Colgate Dental Cream. Remember, Colgate Dental Cream cleans your breath while it cleans your teeth. Here's Dennis with Charles Dance's arrangement of Old Buttermilk Sky. Old Buttermilk Sky, I'm keeping my eye peeled on you. What's the good word tonight? Are you gonna be mellow tonight? Old Buttermilk My little donkey and me We're as happy as a Christmas tree Heading for the one I love I'm gonna pop her the question That question Do you, darling, do you do? It'll be easy So easy if I can only bank on you, all buttermilk sky, I'm telling you why, now you know, keep it in mind tonight, keep a brush and most clouds from sight. Old buttermilk sky, won't you fail me when I'm needing you most? Hang a moon above her kitchen post, hitch me to the one I love. You can if you Be with us again next week for another Dennis Day program. More songs, more adventures in the life of our star, Dennis Day. Meanwhile, be sure to use Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth.
Say hello to Halo Shampoo for naturally bright and beautiful hair. Remember, even finest soaps and soap shampoos hide the natural luster of your hair with dulling soap film. But Halo Shampoo contains no soap, therefore leaves no dulling soap film. Even in hardest water, Halo makes oceans of rich, fragrant lather, quickly banishes loose dandruff and dirt. Halo needs no lemon or vinegar rinse. Say hello to Halo and goodbye to dulling soap film. Get Halo Shampoo at any cosmetic counter. This is Dennis again. Good night, everybody. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. Ladies and gentlemen, the Joseph Schlitz Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, presents The Halls of Ivy, starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. I was curious. I tasted it. Now I know why Schlitz is the beer that made Milwaukee famous. If you like good beer, you'll find it pays to be curious and learn about Schlitz for yourself. And now, the Halls of Ivy. Welcome again to Ivy, the College of Ivy and the town of Ivy, USA. Dr. William Todd Hunter Hall, like any other college president or almost any kind of executive, has to make certain concessions to his superior officers. For instance, he must on occasion have lunch with some of the members of the Board of Governors when he would far prefer to spend that hour and a half playing a game of chess with his wife, Victoria, who was, until her marriage, the toast of the English musical comedy stage. With chess at the halls, it doesn't matter much who wins, but a college president must not permit himself to be checkmated too many times by his board of governors, even at a luncheon at the faculty club like this one. Enjoy your lunch, Doctor? Very much, Mr. Mer- Merriweather, very much. I've also enjoyed the opportunity to discuss these matters with the board members present, and to have the... Oh, pardon me, Mr. Wellman, but that is my milk you're drinking. Oh, it is? Oh, I'm sorry, Doctor. Thoughtless of me. I thought I had ordered milk myself. You did, Clarence, and drank that, too. You also ate my strawberries. <laughs> if you uh, lunch with us often, Dr. Hall, you'll learn to keep an eye on Clarence. The man's a gastronomic kleptomaniac. Order something he likes and he swoops down on it like a vulture. Don't be silly, Merriweather. I'm... Well, I'm simply a trifle absent-minded. So much on my mind. If there's anything disturbing you that we haven't talked about, Mr. Wellman... Um, you know, anything I can help with. By all means, let's have it. Ah, that's the spirit, Doctor. Relieve his mind and protect your lunch. Yes. <laughs> well, Clarence, what's your trouble? Weak track team this year? Or did you get snubbed by some house mother? Don't be so flippant, Merriweather. Merely because I happen to take the affairs of this college rather seriously. Well, we all I... take them seriously, son. But let's take the long view. In a hundred years, after the dust of the last atom bomb has cleared away, nothing we say here today will seem quite worth that long face of yours. My long face, as you call it, is the result of shouldering my responsibilities and keeping my nose to the grindstone. That's no grindstone, Clarence. It's my coffee. (laughs) For Pete's sake, how many things do you drink? (laughs) Uh, Let me order you some coffee of your own, Mr. Wellman. Oh, he'd hate it, Doctor. Never touches the stuff. It happened to be right in front of me. You'd have found it in a (laughs) foxhole. Now, go on, Clarence. Finish Dr. Hall's ice cream and tell us your trouble. (laughs) Dr. Hall's ice cream... I'm sorry, Doctor. I, I didn't realize... No, no, no. You're, you're quite welcome to it, Mr. Wellman. Now, uh, was there something you wanted me to do? Uh, yes, Dr. Hall. It will be necessary for you to address the student body in chapel tomorrow. Oh? The Reverend Dr. Gilby is ill, you know. 
Oh, I haven't heard. Nothing serious, I hope. No, I don't think so, Doctor. Just picked up a bug somewhere. By tomorrow, they'll discover a new miracle drug to cure him. By next week, they'll find the new miracle drug makes his ears fall off. You can't wait. <laughs> well, I'm sincerely sorry to hear about Dr. Gilby's illness. And, of course, I'll address Chapel tomorrow. Although I, uh, really, I haven't not much experience in clerical oratory. But now, if you gentlemen will excuse me... Oh, sure, Doctor. I, I think we're all through. Uh, this is my lunch, you know. Oh, thank you. Why don't you let me take the check for change, Marietta? All right. <laughs> uh, uh, waiter. Check, please. <laughs> Dr. Hall's at a luncheon, Miss Lee, but I'm sure he'll be home very soon if you'd like to wait. I'm afraid I'd better not, Mrs. Hall. Thank you. My train leaves in an hour, but Dr. Hall has always been so nice to me. He's such a fine man. I thought I owed it to him to explain why I'm leaving Ivy. Leaving Ivy, Miss Lee? But I thought, well, aren't you the Margaret Lee who's up for president of the student council? Was, Mrs. Hall. The field is now open for a new candidate. One with lower marks, possibly, but a higher social standing. Perhaps one whose family is less than 4,000 years old. Oh, Mrs. Hall, my father was so proud of me. And now... No, no, please, dear, sit down there. Why, why don't you cry a little? It helps sometimes, you know. Tears are a sort of window-washing operation. You see things a little more clearly through the panes. I've cried myself dry, Mrs. Hall. Some of it was self-pity, I guess, and some of it was... Well, I suppose I just overrated the decency of the student body. Mm, I think it far more likely, my dear, that a few members of it have underrated you. You mustn't condemn an institution because some of its windows rattle. Dr. Hall is going to be very disturbed about this. Do you know how vicious student politics can be, Mrs. Hall? Well, no, I'm afraid I don't, my dear. But uh, if there's anything like backstage politics, which I happen to have known intimately, they can give you a pretty rough time. I've been up against a great deal of snobbery and discrimination myself. In England, as an English woman, among English people. Yes, and here, too. In fact, four or five weeks ago, I wasn't sure that I was welcome at Ivy. Even Dr. Hall was none too certain. But your case cuts a little deeper. I realize that. You'll never know how deep, Mrs. Hall, I hope. I flattered myself that I'd been accepted, that my scholarship record and my fitness for the presidency would make up for my being an alien. But, well, the... The organized ostracism... Oh, I'm sure, Margaret, that a handful of unthinking... Don't try, Mrs. Hall. My people have always won by retreating. Maybe I'm making history. I'm retreating without winning. I guess I just didn't realize how well the Exclusion Act was enforced. I'm afraid I'm not too well equipped to cope with this, Margaret. But I'm sure you know how I feel about it. I do, Mrs. Hall. And I'm grateful. And please tell Dr. Hall how I... How I appreciate everything he... Everything is... Home is the sailor, home from the sea. Have you, my popsy, a welcome for me? Take it, matey. <laughs> Have a nice luncheon. Yes, my dear, quite pleasant. Mr. Wellman paid the check. Nice of him. Nice of him. My dear girl, you can't dismiss an announcement of this importance with any such offhand remark. <laughs> Mr. Wellman, paying a luncheon check is as world-shaking as the discovery of the wheel. <laughs> you mean Mr. Wellman is tight, Toddy? Tight is rather a brutal way to express it, Victoria, but I find it charmingly accurate. <laughs> Mr. Wellman is extremely imminent in the sense of being close. <laughs> <laughs> I... I have heard that he launders his pipe cleaners. Oh. <laughs> I suppose he got so tremendously rich throwing his money about. Uh, Vicky, darling, Mr. Wellman throwing his money about is a spectacle which Mr. Cecil J. DeMille... B. Hmm? Cecil B. DeMille, B for bastard. Oh, yes, thank you. Thank you, yes. <laughs> uh, Mr. Wellman throwing his money about is a spectacle which Mr. Cecil B. DeMille wouldn't even attempt. And I recall how generous, yes, even spontaneously generous, Mr. Wellman has been with his millions for this school and how frugal he can be with... Vicky, hmm? what's wrong? Wrong? What do you mean? Oh, I mean, my dear, that no one can love someone as much as I love you and not be instantly aware of a shadow on that someone's face. Tell me, please. 
Oh, Toddy, I wish this hadn't come up. You have so many things to cope with. Now, what's the matter? Did something happen while I was out at lunch? Well, not to me, dear. In fact, it has nothing to do with me personally, except that, well, it's disturbing to see any youngster with a broken heart. Do you know a student called Margaret Lee? No, I don't think... Wait a moment. Lee? Yes, uh, a very neat and rather frail girl, quite intelligent looking. That's the one. Well, of course I know her. Of her, rather. A fine student. Not anymore, William. She's gone home. I did my best to persuade her to stay and talk to you, but I doubt if even you... Oh, it was really very sad. Now, my dear, don't distress yourself. This is my problem now. Sit down and tell me about it. Tell me the whole story. Well, as you know, Margaret Lee came to this country for her education. She chose Ivy. And you know what she did. It's a wicked thing, Vicky. The antithesis of everything we have tried to instill in the men and women here at Ivy. I'm sorry that I wasn't here in time to talk to the girl. Mm. I'm afraid I handled it rather badly, William. She was so depressed and discouraged that... Well, I don't know too much about this part of the job. A campus politics always as bad as this? Oh, no, no, of course not. But I must say that I sometimes stand aghast at the utter ruthlessness of these young people. Young, of course, is the key word in that admission. They're all children... Callously pulling the wings off butterflies. As far as I'm concerned, one of the chief purposes of education, the chief purpose, if you like, is to impart an understanding of the butterfly's viewpoint. Uh, whenever I hear of a student being made the victim of prejudice, I feel that I've failed in some... Uh, yes, Penny? Beg pardon, sir, but there was a message from the Reverend Gilby. Seems like he was took sick, sir, and wanted to know if you yes, could... Yes, I, have... I know. I, I received the message at lunch, Penny. Thank you. I've got a Bible, sir, if you'd care to borrow... Me I Penny. have a Bible, Penny. Thank you. Fast welcome, sir. Any time at all. Well, she's <laughs> uh, turning out to be quite a day. What was that all about? Well, Dr. Gilby, the chaplain, is ill. I am pinch-hitting for him, if that isn't too irreverent a word, in chapel tomorrow morning. Uh, Vicky, I don't want you to come. I feel I should be very inadequate. Oh, nonsense, Toddy. You'll do a lovely performance. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if you were held over for a second week. <laughs> um, held over, Victoria, is not very good ecclesiastical terminology. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I love Dr. Gilby, and he has everybody with him from the TDM to the recessional. But you'll be wonderful, too. Did you ever hear Charles Lawton give a Bible reading? Uh, no, and I must say it sounds quite unexpected. Unexpected, but intensely interesting. Uh, funny, too. In fact, it inspired me to do a great deal more Bible reading. Well, I'm afraid I haven't Mr. Lawton's elocutionary gifts. But if Captain Bly can do it without the congregation resorting to... Uh, mutiny, maybe... Uh, Dr. Christian Hall can rely on the student's... Uh, bounty of generosity. Ha, 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 I say, that was rather good, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> it was... Just go on like that and you'll wow them. <laughs> I was curious. I tasted it. Now I know why Schlitz is the beer that made Milwaukee famous. Before we return to the Halls of Ivy, starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman, let's listen to the story of a man who not only kept up with the Joneses, but found himself considerably ahead of them, simply by doing the most natural thing in the world. Last night I told Ethel, uh, that's my wife, Ethel, you shouldn't be so self-conscious. The Joneses will just have to take us for what we are. But you know women, and Ethel, well, when we've got company coming, especially the Joneses, there's just no living with her. She's so afraid of what they might think. Gets in a regular stew about how she looks, how the house looks, what kind of jokes I'm liable to tell. You know, you probably have a wife of your own. And like your wife, Ethel usually gets herself all worked up for nothing. That's how it was last night when the Joneses came over. The minute they walked in, I could see Ethel was nervous as a cat. So, just to break the ice, I went into the kitchen and got out the Schlitz beer. When I brought it in, Jones started to look interested right away. Said he had heard a lot about Schlitz, but... Never tasted it. Which was kind of a surprise because Jones is one of those fellows who's so particular about everything. Always insists on the best, or so he says. 
Anyway, Jones raised his glass of Schlitz, and we both drank. First thing you know, Jones put his glass down, and with a satisfied look on his face, slapped his knee, turned to Ethel, and said, Ethel, I don't know who deserves the credit, you or that husband of yours, but by George, this is the best glass of beer I've tasted in years. Well, that did it. That's all Ethel needed. You should have seen her face, just like a kid's at Christmas. As for Jones, he never even noticed. He was still busy talking. And he took the words right out of my mouth when he said, No wonder they call Schlitz the beer that made Milwaukee famous. Turn to Ivy, we find a perturbed Dr. Hall striding back and forth in the living room, as Mrs. Hall says. Toddy, stop pacing. Break into a trot or a single foot or a gallop. Or better still, sit down here with me. Mm, I'm a little restless, Victoria. That matter of the Lee girl. You know, I went to the station to find her. I thought I might be able to persuade her to reconsider, but I was too late. I'm awfully sorry. I'm sure you could have done something. You're very persuasive, you know. Then I wired her aboard the train. But not knowing what space she was occupying, I wasn't any too... It's the telephone. I know, I hear it, but where is it? I'm going to put that extension cord on a deep-sea fishing reel with a strong spring. It's right near me somewhere. Oh, Oh, here, under the evening paper. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hall's residence... Spokane, Washington? Good heavens, the Lee girl must have taken a very fast Yes, to... yes, put him on, please. Hello, Frederick? Yes, I am indeed. Now, are you ready? Rook to the King's Bishop's Three. Check. <laughs> How do you like them apples, Frederick? Goodbye. <laughs> Poor old Frederick. <laughs> Lost both nights last September and can't get his queen out. Oh, don't these long-distance chess games run up some pretty fancy telephone bills? Oh, not for me, my love. You'll notice that I always received the calls. I never initiate. Oh. <laughs> oh, I, I only play cross-country chess with those of my professional acquaintances who are equipped to finance them and at their invitation. Oh, I'm no Reshevsky, but playing 20 simultaneous games blindfolded, but I'm pretty good. I didn't know there were any college professors who could afford that sort of playing. Oh, there are a few. Pitifully few, I must admit. You know the ones who have written cloak and sword novels for Hollywood, under assumed names, of course. And the unmarried ones who prefer to spend their budgets playing chess by phone rather than go night clubbing. You gave up a lot of things to marry me, too, didn't you? <laughs> I certainly did, my darling. Bad meals, dull evenings, risky encounters with emotional undergraduates, and a... Uh, And a growing certainty that life was passing me by. Like poor old Frederick in Spokane, without a queen, I was playing a losing game. Well, Toddy, you're you're so dependable, particularly when it comes to giving a wife the right answers. I think one of the reasons I fell so deeply and so permanently in love with you, Vicky, was because you asked the kind of questions I was able to answer. Oh, one of the reasons I loved you, Toddy, was that if you didn't know the answers, you made them up. (laughs) But didn't happen many times. Ah, uh, you have a very gracious memory, my sweet. You asked a million questions I was unable to answer. Remember the evening by the sea at Brighton? With the full moon across the water? And dance music from the hotel? Battling the elements to be heard? It's been a lovely evening, William. I remember it for long, long. I remember it always. You won't have to make any effort toward it, Victoria. I'll be reminding you. By mail, by cable, by... Is there such a thing as a carrier seagull? Well, if there isn't, I'll train a few. Has anyone ever had a pet seagull? I don't know, my dear. But if I were a seagull and you wanted me for a pet, I'm sure I... Did you shiver? Are you cold? I've never been warmer. I was just shaking off the thought that we'd ever have to communicate with each other by mail or cable or seagull. Tell me... Doesn't a sabbatical ever stretch? Only when one has wealthy relatives and a disregard for one's job, Mm. Vicky. And I have neither. My sabbatical stretches only into next week. It seems only a week since it started. For us, I mean. Oh, it started earlier for me. It started when I bought one ticket to give them tears. 
because I didn't know where else to go for the evening. I think I knew you were there, even then. No, no, you didn't. That was the night the man who played the vicar had such a cold that you were reading all his lines. <laughs> you were too busy. <laughs> Whatever made you come back? I haven't the faintest idea. Not the faintest? Oh, well, possibly. It was because I just happened to think that you were the most delightful, the most charming, the most enchanting, the most... Go on. Uh, go on. Oh, is that all? Oh. <laughs> I wish you'd come backstage after the first time you saw the play, William, instead of the 27th. It's too bad we can't reach around in time and snatch back a few lost weeks, isn't it? Not completely lost, my dear. I saw you almost every night and dreamed of you every day. I was on my way to becoming the traditional absent-minded professor instead of the most timid one. Oh, Vicky, my dear, I am so, so... So? So very fond of you. And I'm very fond of you, William. In fact, I'm very fond of everything tonight. Life and the sea and the moon and the... Professor, why is the moon always associated with lovers? Well, uh, considering that I have been in love for such a short time, my dear, I'm rather ill-equipped to answer that question. But, uh, unless I'm wrong, the moon was once part of this earth. And I suppose that lovers are really a little bit a part of each other. They share an orbit of their own. It's strange, isn't it, that the moon has been shared by millions of lovers and is still on an exclusive basis with all of them. It's our moon. Isn't it, William? Yes. I filed our claim this morning with the Royal Astronomical Society in London. Good. <laughs> I also claimed a proprietary interest in every seventh wave, every fifth seagull. Beg pardon, sir. It's ten o'clock. Ah, listen to them, Victoria. Even the seagulls sound human tonight. Sir? I could swear that one of them spoke to me. Hi, and... darling. Penny is speaking to uh, you. Penny, do seagulls have to... Oh, oh, Penny. Oh, I... <laughs> I was thinking of something else. Um, uh, what is it, Penny? Ten o'clock, sir. You said to let you know when it was ten o'clock. On account of you wanted to get to bed early. On account of you was going to talk in chapel tomorrow. Oh, yes, and on yes, Penny, so he did. Thank you, Penny. Good night. Good night, sir. Good night, Mum. Toddy, you were a million miles away. 238,857, to be exact. <laughs> Curious, isn't it, Vicky? That so much has been said about the man in the moon... And so little about the moon in a man. Darling, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, just a brief planetary excursion. <laughs> Speaking of which, if I am to star in chapel tomorrow, I must get some sleep. Your routine set? Victoria, um, you, you, you make me sound like a trained seal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, darling. Do you know what you're going to say? Well, I know my text, but I guess the sermon will have to... Oh, sort of come out its own way. You're going to talk about Margaret Lee? Yes, yes, I am. I don't believe Dr. Gilby would have done that. Oh, I don't think it's quite as much his problem as mine. But his chapel is a house of truth, and I'm going to tell the truth about Margaret Lee. Good for you. Now get some sleep so you look absolutely dreamy in the morning. Well, now, Victoria. And I'll be in the third row centre right across the aisle from the critics. Oh, Toddy, I can hardly wait. Wait? For what, my dear? For the papers. I'm dying to read your notices. <laughs> I'm glad to report that Dr. Gilby is not seriously ill and should be with you again tomorrow. I, I welcome this opportunity to call to your attention a situation which has arisen here at Ivy. And since it concerns a matter of faith, there could be no better place to speak of it than in this chapel. And no better time for it than on the eve of National Brotherhood Week, proclaimed by our president throughout the nation. A young woman, a brilliant student, with such a record of achievement and reputation for integrity, 
that she was an outstanding candidate for the highest office within the gift of the undergraduate body. This young woman has left Ivy and returned to her home. Against unfair student politics, snobbery, and racial prejudice, she fought a good fight and thought she had lost. In her conception and practice of decent human behavior, she has shown, I believe, no lack. Therefore, she does not leave here the poorer. Rather is it some of you who have found wanting. And by the same token, I too must have a sense of failure. Tolerance is a word I would rather not use. It seems to indicate a condescension. I prefer the word understanding. And intelligent understanding is as essential to our study of human relationship as it is to our comprehension of, of Latin or science. We must learn not only the meaning of democracy, but its application and practice. Or in after years, our boast of a superior way of life will be a sham, and Ivy College will have failed in its primary function, a preparation for life. I would like now to inform you that I have been in communication with this young lady, and she is returning to school. I hope I may rely on the student body to conduct the forthcoming election for president of the council on a basis of merit untinged by social bias, so that her faith in us will be restored. Ladies and gentlemen of Ivy, the human race is not an exclusive club with a selective membership. We are all members from birth. True, it has both active and associate members, and it is up to each of us to provide our own classification. But I consider it one of the most important functions of education. So to instruct you in the humanities, that when your membership in this human society is ended, the recording secretary may mark you paid in full. tasted it. Now I know why Schlitz is the beer that made Milwaukee famous. And here again are Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. Good night, everyone. Good night. We'll be seeing you next week at this time at the Halls of Ivy starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. The other players were Barbara Jean Wong, Gloria Gordon, Herb Butterfield, and Willard Waterman. Tonight's script was written by Don Quinn and Walter Brown Newman. Our music was composed and conducted by Henry Russell. The Halls of Ivy was created by Don Quinn, directed by Nat Wolf, and presented by the Joseph Schlitz Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Ken Carpenter speaking. Stay tuned for We the People over most of these NBC stations. The Mel Blanc Show, written by Mac Bedoff, with Mary Jane Croft, Joe Kearns, Hans Conrad, the sportsman, Victor Miller and his orchestra, and starring the creator of the voice of Bugs Bunny. Hey. What's up, Doc? 
<laughs> yes, Colgate Tooth Powder for a breath that's sweet and teeth that sparkle brings you the Mel Blanc Show with Mel playing his new character, Zookie. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Hi. <laughs> and starring himself in person, Mel Blake. Hi, folks. Ugga, ugga, boo, ugga, boo, boo, ugga. All over the country, business firms preparatory to filing their tax statements are making their estimates of earnings for the fiscal year. In New York, insurance executive William Lenahan checks his statement. Income, 157000 Expenditures, 122000 Net, 35000 Everything checks. I'm heading for Florida. And in Los Angeles, Oliver B. Schwab, prominent attorney, checks his statement. Income, 400000 Expenditures, 300000 Net, 100000 Everything checks. I'm heading for Palm Springs. And in Mel Blanc's little town, Mel Blanc, fix-it shop proprietor, checks his statement. Income? Hmm. Liabilities? Hmm. Profit for the year? Hmm. Everything checks. I'm heading for bankruptcy. And as soon as Mel's bank checked his statement, they agreed with him. So today, on his birthday, Mel Blank received this letter. And in order to satisfy your creditors... We shall be forced to sell your fix-it shop at public auction. Signed, Roger P. Grimes, President. Gosh, auctioning off my fix-it shop today. I bet they wouldn't do it if they knew it was my birthday. Let's see what else it says in the letter. P.S. Happy birthday. (laughs) Today it's my birthday. Tomorrow it's Lincoln's. Now I know what they meant when they wrote that song, What a Difference a Day Makes. <laughs> oh, here comes Betty. She'll have a kind word for me. Hello, Mel. I heard the news about the auction. Yeah. Isn't it terrible? Oh, darling, don't worry. Plan. After all, the auction, you might be able to buy back some of your stuff. With what, a dollar eighty? The fixtures alone are worth a dollar. Nerve of that bank foreclosing. Well, it's your own fault for letting the place run down. Look at the way everything's scattered around. Well, I know exactly where everything is. Oh, yes. Suppose I said to you, where's the can of red paint? What would you say? You're sitting on it. What? <laughs> well, don't worry. The lid's on. Gosh, to think that my fix-it shop is being auction- auctioned off on, on this day of all days. Why, well, what's today? Betty, you mean to say you don't know what day this is? Why? Well, uh... Well, what does this remind you of? La, 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 to you. La, 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 to you. La, 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 Mel Blank. La, 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 to you. I know. What? It's a rainy night in Rio. <laughs> no, they grow an awful lot of coffee in Brazil. <laughs> Fine thing. Oh, hello, Benny. Hello, Mel. Hello. I understand they're auctioning off your fixture shop today, Mel. <laughs> Well, you may be out in the street. <laughs> out and out, but nothing to eat. <laughs> Please, Mr. Colby, don't be so unhappy. Oh, Mel. Well, what if you are a flop? So you don't make money. What's the difference? You can't take it with you. Yeah, but I'd sure like to see some of it before I go. <laughs> Well, it takes time to be successful, Mel. Why, when I first opened my supermarket years ago, I lived on practically nothing. I bought a suit for six dollars. What do you think of that? It still looks good on you. (laughs) I mean, Mel Blank, I have no sympathy for you. I've worked hard and made a name for myself. Why, do you know what people call me? Please, Mr. Colby, not in front of Betty. (laughs) Why, you... Oh, 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 I've had it. Come on, Betty. Goodbye, Mel. How do you like that? My own girl walks out on me. Her father calls me a moron. They take away my fix-it shop. And all this on my birthday. They can't do this to me. I'm a citizen. I owe taxes. <laughs> Boy, they'd be sorry if I were dead. They'd say, gosh, we all forgot Mel on his birthday. We were mean to him. We didn't love him. I know what I'll do. I'll hang myself on the tree on Colby's lawn. 
No, I better not do that. Mr. Colby doesn't like me hanging around his house. <laughs> if I were dead, oh, how sorry they'd be. Say, I got a great idea. I know what to do. Where's my assistant, Zuki? Zuki! Zuki! <laughs> Okay, Zuki, start yelling now. Mel Blank. He jumped in the river. Mel Blank. Mel Blank. Mel Blank. Yeah. Who's he? Well, he he he's the nicest guy. He he's the sweetest He's the most wonderful. He's a jerk. Uh, why did he do it? Well, he, his girl walked out on him. He, 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 you see, he, her, her father hated him. They foreclosed his business. And, and, and nobody remembers his birthday. <laughs> no reason at all. Uh, how do you know all this? Well, he, he told me he was going to jump off a, a ten-story building. Oh, that's impossible. The tallest building in this town is only five stories. <laughs> Yeah, I know. <laughs> he was going to jump off twice. <laughs> Gee, ain't it awful? Oh, oh well, look, there's Mel's hat floating on the water. What a tragedy. Probably my size, too. Well, I'm going home now. Hang the flag out the window. Hey, you're going to do that for Mel? No, tomorrow's Lincoln's birthday. Oh, say, say, that's right. i got to do it, too. Yeah. Come on. Oh, oh okay, Mel. Uh, the, uh, they're all gone now. How do you like that? No sympathy at all. All I think about is Lincoln. Forgot all about me. I'll show this town. By the time I'm through, I'll be such a big man, Lincoln will be hanging a flag out for me. Okay, town, just wait and see. <laughs> Teeth that sparkle and dazzle, a breath that's fresh and sweet. Then try Colgate Tooth Powder, for the new all-purpose Colgate Tooth Powder cleans your teeth and sweetens your breath. Yes, this new all-purpose tooth powder produces an amazingly rich, active foam that's marvelously effective. Every time you brush your teeth with this new all-purpose Colgate Tooth Powder, your whole mouth feels clean, sweet, fresh. Your teeth regain their natural sparkle. It's been proved in seven cases out of ten that Colgate tooth powder instantly stops unpleasing breath that originates in the mouth. And as for cleaning, you can depend on Colgate tooth powder revealing the natural brilliance of your teeth, giving them that pearly, polished feeling. Yes, Colgate tooth powder, the new all-purpose tooth powder, does everything you can expect or ask of a dentifrice, and does it beautifully. Try Colgate tooth powder today for teeth that sparkle and a breath that's sweet. Use Colgate tooth powder. Well, folks, it looks like this is the end. Don't tune out, folks. This is only the beginning. Nobody remembered Mel on his birthday. And the bank is auctioning off his fix shop today. So Mel jumped into the river. Is he kidding? I can't stand cold water. So for Colgate tooth powder, I want to say goodbye. Hello. Well, so far, my plan's working. Everybody thinks I jumped into the river. I'll turn on the radio and see if they're saying anything about it. Ah, there's good news tonight. <laughs> Wrong station. I'll try another one. Friends, a terrible tragedy has all taken us. Oh, that's more like it. A great tragedy. The entire nation is prostrate. And as we all sit and worry, we wonder, will Dick Tracy get away from influence? <laughs> oh, a fine thing. I'll take these different disguises and go out and talk with my friends. I'll see how sorry they are. 
Oh, there's Mr. Colby. He's probably getting here early for the auction. Oh, uh, pardon me, friend. May I trouble you for a match? Good man, who do you think I am? Santa Claus? <laughs> the, uh, I'm looking for a uh, Mel Blank. Well, if you're looking for that idiot, he's not around. He drowned himself this afternoon. Oh, too bad. His uncle died, and I came to bring him the legacy. Eighteen million pounds, fourteen guineas, twelve shillings, four crowns, six pence, high penny, half penny, who penny, hip penny, and a whole penny. <laughs> but if he's dead, I'll have to give it to his dearest friend. Uh, uh, does he have such in the stone? Oh, uh, well, I'm his dearest friend. But you called him an idiot. Uh, oh, idiot. Oh, well, that's an American word for friend. Well, uh, I'll have to go and think it over. Uh, so long, jackass. Jackass? Aye, uh, that's a Scotch word for friend. <laughs> so that's the way Colby feels, huh? For $18 million, he's my friend. Who needs him? For $18 million, I can be my own friend. <laughs> I wonder how the rest of the town feels. Uh Uh-oh, here comes my girl, Betty. I'll put on this beret and test her. Uh, Pardon me, uh, ma chérie. I'm looking for the Mel Blanc. Mel Blanc? Oh, he just jumped in the river over there. Oh, too bad. The girls of France, they will feel terrible to hear that. There was not a girl in France who would not give her right arm for a kiss from Mel Blanc. In fact, in the town of Marseille, all the girls are called lefty. Uh, I am Mel Blanc's cousin, Rue de la Blanc. I uh, just left his aunt, uh, Eiffel, a very tall woman. Uh, I have come from France with ten million francs given to him by the girls of Paris for his great work. Oh, what work? I do not know what his work was, but all the girls say he was a great worker. (laughs) But if Mel Blanc is not here, I was told to give the money to his girlfriend. Oh, well, I'm his girlfriend. You? Uh, whose birthday is it today? Oh, it's tomorrow, and it's Lincoln's birthday. Now, may I have the money? The money you want? Go ask Lincoln. Au revoir. <laughs> well, so that's the way my girl feels. I'm getting to wish I was in the river under that hat. Oh, here comes Mr. Cushing, my lodge president. Maybe he's got a kind word. Eh... Uh, Hello, friend. Ugga, ugga, boo, ugga, boo, boo, ugga. Well, greetings, friend. Ugga, ugga, boo, ugga, boo, boo, ugga. <laughs> hey, I never saw you before. How come you know the password? Well, I'm a member of the Jennings Junction Local Order of uh, Benevolent Zebras. I came down to represent the lodge for Mel Blank. Oh, terrible thing. Finding this hat in the river. Oh, you don't know what a blow it was to me. Really? Yeah, at first I thought that hat belonged to my wife. <laughs> Oh, aren't you sorry about Brother Blank? Oh, yes, I am. Yes, I am. He was a good friend of mine. May his auger rest in boo. <laughs> Must have been a terrible decision for him to make jumping into the river. Well, I don't know. Every morning when I have breakfast, I read a newspaper over the coffee. Sometimes the newspaper drops, and I look at my wife. My, that river looks good. <laughs> Is your uh, wife that bad looking? Well, I'll tell you, friend. Every morning, my wife eats cereal. Now, you know how cereals are. They jump, they crack, they pop, they snap. When my wife looks at them, they just lay there and grow. (laughs) Of course, she's always trying to reduce, so she eats a lot of carrots. Carrots, carrots, carrots. Is she losing weight? No, no, but this morning, when I come down to breakfast, she said, um, "Ah, What's up, (laughs) Doc? As long as she reads and I read, I'm satisfied. <laughs> she reads at breakfast, too? Oh, yes, yes, she does. She studies the horoscope all the time. A lot of good it does her. You see, she's born under the sign of Taurus the Bull. But she still looks like Elsie the Cow. <laughs> well, how's it going, Brother Z, brother? Oh, well, uh, wait a second. Where are you going? Well, I can do one or two things. I can go to the movies and see The Razor's Edge. Or I can go home and cut my throat. So long, I'm going to go, 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 I'm going to
Didn't say a word about me disappearing. Never even missed me. Nobody misses me. It's like they never even knew I was around. I might just as well be vice president of the United States. <laughs> well, now, now to get back to the fix it shop and watch that vulture banker Grimes auction off my shop. <laughs> gentlemen, we are gathered here to auction off Mel Blanc's fix-it shop, and even though his sudden departure saddens us, let us not have that interfere with our bids, shall we? <laughs> How do you like that? What a hypocrite. Mel Blanc was near and dear to all of us. Why? Why, there isn't a house in this town that doesn't have a memento to remind them of Mel Blanc. A broken clock, a washing machine that doesn't work. A lamp that just stands there, darkening up some bright corner. <laughs> and yet I know that if that noble figure were alive today, first thing that he would say is, deposit your money in the First National Bank. What a lot of baloney. If he'd only give somebody else a chance to speak. Well, be before we start the auction, is there someone here who would like to say a few kind words in behalf of Mel Blank? Any words. They don't even have to be kind. <laughs> Looks like I'll have to do it myself. I know. I'll act like I'm tipsy. Yeah. Hey, uh, just a second, buddy. Yeah. I, I'm a friend of Blank's, and today happens to be his birthday. But everybody remembers Lincoln. Why? I don't know. Lincoln split rails. Well, my pal Mel Blank split rails for three years. <laughs> Got a house full of rails. And nobody remembers him. And Benjamin Franklin invented the kite. Who helped them? Blank. Robert Fulton, inventor of the steam engine. Stole it from Blank. <laughs> the Wright brothers, inventor of the aeroplane. Who gave them the idea? A bird. <laughs> That's who. But where did the bird get it from? Mal Blank. And why wasn't Mal Blank in on the atomic bomb? I'll tell you why. He was sick. <laughs> I could go on forever. And I think I will. Uh, <laughs> yes, now, if you don't mind, my friend, we've got to get on with the auction. Now, the entire store goes lock, stock, and barrel, including all Mel Blank's personal effects, belongings, and clothes. Now, what, what am I bid? One cent. <laughs> One cent? Why, for two cents? I am bid two cents. Now, who will make it three? Three. Pennies? Why, the least I could do is start the bidding of dollars. A, a, a dollar is bid. Going, going. Do I hear more? Gone. Sold to this gentleman for one dollar. And what is your name, sir? I'll, I'll tell you my name. It's Mel Blank. So you're not even amazed, huh? Well, I found out what you all thought of me. You don't care whether I'm alive or dead. You're only interested in yourselves. You, Banker Grimes, hanging up that sign that says, Here's your fix-it shop, Mel Blank. And you, Mr. Colby, putting that plate of cold cuts and potato salad on the table. What do you think this is, a party? And you, Betty, carrying that birthday cake that says, Happy Birthday, Mel Blank. Why, you don't even know it's my birthday. Happy Birthday, Mel... Happy Birthday, Mel Blank! Surprise! Surprise! What? Hey, what's going on here? Oh, there, you big, sweet... <laughs> I don't know what to call you, darling. What a day you gave us today. Well, you mean this, this surprise, this party is for me? You knew all the time I wasn't in the river? Hoot, man, yes. <laughs> what a Scotchman you are. <laughs> and all the girls, they call themselves lefties. And I didn't fool you either. Gosh, I, I got a lump in my throat. Now, remember, Mel, people think about you even though they don't show it. That's the motto of the First National Bank. <laughs> Well, how do you feel, Mel? Gosh, Betty, I, I'm speechless. There's only one thing I can say. What's that? <laughs> this is Mel Blank saying thanks for listening and reminding you all that this is Boy Scout Week. Tonight we want to join in saluting the 1,980,000 Scouts in America and their brother Scouts in 51 nations of the world. Good night, Andy. The be the be the be That's all, no? This is 
buddies from reminding you that Colgate Tooth Powder for a breath that's sweet and teeth that sparkle brings you the Mel Blanc Show every Tuesday at this time. Be sure to join us again next Tuesday night for more fun with Mel and the people you'll meet in Mel Blanc's Fix-It Shop. Say hello to Halo Shampoo for naturally bright and beautiful hair. Remember, even finest soaps and soap shampoos hide the natural luster of your hair with dulling soap film. But Halo Shampoo contains no soap, therefore leaves no dulling soap film. Even in hardest water, Halo makes oceans of rich, fragrant lather, quickly banishes loose dandruff and dirt. Halo needs no lemon or vinegar rinse. Say hello to Halo and goodbye to dulling soap film. Get Halo Shampoo at any cosmetic counter. <laughs> It's Texaco time with Fred Allen. Texaco dealers from coast to coast present the Texaco Star Theater, starring Fred Allen, with Frank Sinatra, America's new singing sensation, Hilo Jack and the Dame, Portland Hopper, the Texaco Workshop Players, Al Goodman, and his orchestra. And this is yours truly, Jimmy Wallington, reminding you that even though you drive slower these days, warm weather can make your car wear out faster, unless it's protected by proper care and lubrication. Make your car last. Tomorrow, take it to your neighborhood Texaco dealer for a Texaco Spring Party. This week, ladies and gentlemen, Winston Churchill is in Washington. Every time Mr. Churchill meets Mr. Roosevelt, something happens. Tonight, we bring you a man who meets you every Sunday night, and nothing happens. And here he is, Fred Allen. <laughs> Thank you, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And Jimmy, I'm glad that you mentioned Mr. Churchill's visit. He certainly surprised everyone, dropping into Washington out of a clear sky. Say, I wonder what Mr. Churchill came over to see the president about, Fred. Well, he came over here to get a ration book, Jimmy. Now, what does Winston Churchill need with a ration book? When the time comes, Mr. Churchill wants to have enough points to bring home the bacon, Jimmy. That's the only reason he would want a ration book. You know, this is the fourth time the president and Mr. Churchill have met, twice at Washington, once at sea, and once at Casablanca. So I wonder where they'll meet the next time, Fred. In Berlin, Jimmy, I'm hoping. <laughs> Do you know why the Germans and the Italians surrendered at Tunisia last week? Uh, why, Fred? They know the quickest way they can get back home to Germany and Italy is to follow the American and English armies. <laughs> you know, uh, 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 in the newsreels, I saw the Germans were yelling, Heil Hitler, and leaving the I out of Heil. I saw the picture. <laughs> well, it only goes to... Mr. Allen! <laughs> Portland, she's with well, you're just, uh, you're just in time, Portland. Jimmy and I were talking over the news of the week. What's new to your grotesque way of thinking? Nothing much. Really? Mama's learning to be a motorman. A mo oh, yes. I read that New York is going to have women running the trolley cars shortly. Do you think your, your uh, mother will make good running a trolley? She should. Mama has a one-track mind. Uh <laughs> Well, that helps more power to the uh, old lady. But uh, have you <laughs> tell me, have they have they trusted your mother? Have they trusted your mother out with a streetcar yet? Yes, Mama made her solo trip yesterday. Oh, she soloed, huh? How did she uh, How did she do? Well, in the morning, Mama ran the trolley cross town on Forty Second Street and only took in eighty five cents. Oh, she had took a commission. I was she was working. <laughs> If she had to pay commission on it, that's no good, is it? 
In the afternoon, Mama cleaned up. How? During the rush hour, Mama ran her trolley down into the subway and made $48. Oh, well, that's the thing to do if you're running a streetcar. Go where the money is. That's... <laughs> And go reminds me, Portland, we'd better go down to Allen's Alley. Oh, have you a question? Oh, yes. Today, with meat rationing, many people are starting to raise a few chickens along with their victory gardens. The Department of Agriculture has had thousands of requests for information on chicken raising. And so, keeping up with the times, our question tonight is, are you raising chickens? And if you are, how are you doing? Shall we go? Well, if we don't, the program will finish 25 minutes early. I'll send it. <laughs> Let us away. Ah, uh, here we are back in Allen's Alley, Portland. I'll see if John Doe is in. Oh, good evening, Brother Allen. Uh, <laughs> are you raising any chickens, Mr. Doe? Don't mention chickens to me. I've been married 30 years. What has being married 30 years got to do with raising chickens? Brother, one old crook around the house is enough. <laughs> Well, it looks as though Mr. Doe with his old hen is all set. Let's see what's going on next door here. No. Ah, <laughs> ah Mrs. Nussbaum, have you done anything about the uh, this poultry business? I'm liking only one egg for breakfast. One egg? Then you only need one chicken. Exactly. A friend is getting for me also one chicken. A Plymouth rack. A Plymouth rack. <laughs> A Plymouth rack with nest complete. Oh, you got a nest that came with the hen, huh? And the eggs started rolling in, did they? What eggs? <laughs> Two weeks later, I am learning. Learning what? The nest is a nest, but the chicken is not a chicken. <laughs> no? It is a rooster. <laughs> <laughs> What did you do? The next day in a frenzy, hmm. I am cooking the whole business. Well, how was it? The rooster is soft. Uh huh. But the nest is delicious. <laughs> well, the uh, next chicken. Uh, I wonder how uh, Socrates Mulligan is faring. I. <laughs> Every time you say hello, you air condition the place, Dr. Lee. <laughs> Tell me, have you uh, have you been fooling around with chickens? Uh, yeah, when they got kids, uh, I figured I'll get me a mix of eggs, hatch them out, and go into the chicken business. Uh-huh, and you uh, you bought the eggs? Uh, I was just going to when a friend wised me up. How, Socrates? Uh, that's French. What do you want, horsing around with eggs and chickens and hatching? Yeah. Uh, he says, get an incubator. It'll do the whole business. And you, uh, you bought an incubator? Uh, six months ago. And today, you are a chicken baron. Uh, today, I am a dead duck. <laughs> <laughs> Why, Socrates? Uh, for six months, I've been running out every morning. Yes? Uh, that darn incubator ain't laid an egg yet. <laughs> well, Socrates will learn that you cannot egg an incubator on. Now, let's see what is going on in this little house at the end of the alley. Bonsoir, all. S'il vous plaît. Falstaff here with Rondelay. Please, Sir Falstaff, no forms tonight. Have you heard she thought that I was just an identity when suddenly I revealed my identity? No. <laughs> or, uh... No, no. Said uh, General Eisenhower to Adolf Hitler, brother, you're getting littler and littler? <laughs> no, I... <laughs> my mother wouldn't have raised me if she knew I had that ace in the hole. Now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. You have five tonight. You uh, upset the whole apple cart here tonight. We are talking about raising chicken. Approximately why I am here. Yeah. I have written a poem. What is your chicken poem called? That's why a hen lays an egg. How does it go? Why does a hen lay an egg? This question is whether the ages. For eons, it baffled men the world or morons as well as sages. Adam first asked the question as the serpent lay coiled in the grass. Adam said, "Why does a hen lay an egg?" The serpent said, brother, I pass. Why does a hen lay an egg? Since Adam's day, it puzzled all scholars. It was asked by Phil Baker last Sunday night. The contestant lost $64. <laughs> Tonight, I will answer this question. 
For the nonce, I am pundit, not joker. The reason a hen lays an egg is because if she coughed up the egg, it would choke her. <laughs> and as false staff picks up his egg and scrambles, we turn to find Hilo Jack and the dame at their microphone. Guided by Maestro Al Goodman, the kids sing Coming In on a Wing and a Prayer. <laughs> Wallington hobbling up to the microphone. What's the trouble, Jimmy? You're limping around like a centipede who's lost his number 17 coupon. Oh, I worked for my victory garden all day yesterday, Fred. I'm a little stiff. A little stiff, he says. You're six feet tall, Jimmy. Well, it's no joke, Fred. You know, a day of hard work certainly taught me one thing. I found out that I'm like the average car. You're like the average car in what way? Well, I'm not as young as I used to be, Fred. Really? No. You know, there aren't any new cars these days, and they're all beginning to feel their age, especially those cars that are still using last winter's lubricant. They feel their years in their years, huh? <laughs> all over, Fred. Oh, I see. But you can give an aging car a new lease on life with a Texaco dealer's spring tonic. That Texaco's famous Marfax 40-point chassis lubrication, a crankcase change to Texaco's insulated Haviland motor oil, and a stem to stern checkup on every point where trouble can start. Battery, radiator, and other danger spots. So see your Texaco dealer soon. That was me for from for me and my gal, play, <laughs> played by Al Goodman and the board. Mr. Goodman's orchestra can be seen any day at the Paramount Theater, waiting in line to hear Harry James. <laughs> and now, and now, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Allen. I, no, I won't have time now, Portland. I have to look over this new song I've written. Yes, you know, this song of mine may be another three itty fishes and an itty bitty poo. You've written a song? <laughs> yeah, well, you can just, you can laugh. Go ahead, you can laugh. If I get, if I can get our guests to sing my song tonight, my song will be number one on your all time, all time, all time. <laughs> Yes. Why, he's the most talked of singer in the country today. His voice is thrilling millions. Gosh, thrilling, Sam? Uh, <laughs> no, no, our guest isn't an opera personality, Portland. <laughs> he's Frank Sinatra. Pull yourself together. You won't you won't have time to, to roll down your stockings and put on your sloppy Joe sweater. If I can get Frank Sinatra to sing my song, I'll be one of the say this may be Frank now. Come in. Oh, yes, miss. Hail to the young Frank Sinatra. Hail to the our oh, eyes of Now wait a minute, wait. Hail just, to the just, just, just please. Uh you are uh I'm Cuddle Flanagan. That's right. You were hailing around here last week. 
You were president of the Fred Allen Fan Club, is that right? Yeah, but that outfit fell apart. Uh... We reorganized. Oh. Well, what is your fan club called now? Chapter one of the girls who would lay down and die for Frank Sinatra. <laughs> What is it you want to... Oh, I got a presentation to give place like to Frank Sinatra. Oh, a presentation? Yeah. I heard Frank Sinatra sing, you'd be so nice to come home to. And you want to give him? My address. Yahoo! <laughs> that, uh... <laughs> that dame would drive the street singer indoors on a sunny day, yes. Well, you see, Portland, what Frank Sinatra's singing is doing to people. If he will only sing my song... Oh, this must be Frank now. Come in. Is Sinatra here yet? Uh, yes, officer. Is something wrong? I'm from the Jitterbug Riot Squad. I've been assigned to Sinatra. Well, you uh, you won't have any trouble here. That's what they told me when they opened at the Paramount. <laughs> and there was confusion? It was a riot. Three of my men were trampled silly with sport shoes. <laughs> and the sergeant... The sergeant was slugged with a loaded yo-yo. Well, I, uh, officer, I think we're prepared tonight. Have you got the stage door bolted? Yes, officer. Got the aisles roped off so the jitterbugs can't dance in them? Yes, officer. You got the screens up so they can't creep in through the air conditioning? Yes. Okay, then I'll make my announcement. Now, please, kids, let's have no trouble tonight. When you tear Mr. Sinatra's clothes off, take them home. Don't leave no rags around the seat. Have you, uh, have you finished? You have another line, officer, if you don't mind. He can't wait to, he can't wait to, he can't wait to see Frank Sinatra himself yet. Yeah, I finished. That takes care of everything. You can bring him on now. Fine. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to have you meet Frank Sinatra. Thank you very much. Uh, gosh, Frank, right now, I must be the envy of every jitterbug in America. Well, how do you mean, Fred? Why, I'm standing right next to you. I'm close enough to touch you. Uh-huh. They told me you'd start off by trying to make a touch. <laughs> Two lines and I'm a straight man already. Well, tell me, Frank, what is this terrific appeal you have? Girl stampede wherever you go. What have you got that I haven't got? Well, uh, perhaps I haven't got something that you have got, Fred. Now, please, no life boy plugs, Frank. Please. All right, all right. Now, look, Frank, you're on the hit parade. You have your own program. You sing at nightclubs and theaters. You must need a lot of songs. Now, I have a song. Uh, blah, 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 uh, blah, blah, Fred, blah. Uh, some other time. I'm working at Frank Daly's Terrace Room over in Newark, and I've got another show to do tonight. Now, look, I can meet you, Frank. I can meet you right after the show. If you, I'll bring my metronome. If you hear me, if you hear me sing this song. No, Fred, I'm sorry. After the show, I've got to rehearse some new numbers. I'm opening the Paramount a week from Wednesday. Again? Well, you were just there. Why, uh, you were just there a few months ago. They held you over for eight weeks. That's right, Fred. The public has been very kind to me. Why, the last time you played the Paramount, the Jitterbugs had a picnic there, Frank. The kids built campfires in the lounge. They had a big weenie roast going in the balcony. And when the picture finally went on, two Guy Lombardo fans were mugged in the mezzanine. Well, Jitterbugs are inclined to be enthusiastic. <laughs> but they're all good kids, really. They are. And uh, speaking of kids, Frank, kids will go for this song I have. Now, look, you say you're tied up tonight. I'll get up early and sing it for you tomorrow morning. I'm sorry. Tomorrow I've got a conference. You know, I'm going to make a picture for RKO. Oh, good. I'm going to make a picture, too. What, uh, what is your picture? It's a musical, Fred, called Higher and Higher. Mm -hmm. Michelle Morgan and George Murphy are in it, too. What is your picture? Well, the, my picture, the story isn't finished yet, Frank. But the cast is all set. I, I, I'm being starred with Gunther Badu and Ingrid Knischmeister. Gunther Badu? Yes, they're both foreign stars, you see. I am the only one who speaks English in the picture. When, when Gunther and Ingrid are on, there'll be titles in English flashed on the bottom of the screen as I am speaking English up screen, you see. <laughs> But this, but this, this song I'm speaking Look, Fred, everybody brings me songs. But Frank, I, every snook I meet thinks he's a songwriter. But Frank, I... Uh, My butcher wrote a song called I Used to Meet You, But I Can't Anymore. 
Even my even my garbage man wrote a song. The garbage man? Yes, Fred. He calls it. I treasure that cemento. It's a little memento of you. <laughs> I am song happy, Fred. Well, all right, all right, Frank. I can take a hint. I have another singer begging for my song. And remember, Frank Sinatra, the day Georgie Jessel takes your place on the hit parade, you will know the reason why. Well, Fred, I'm sorry. Perhaps I've been a little hasty. What is the song of yours? Well, you know what a smash hit Brazil was. Yes. Well, my song is the closest you can get to Brazil. It's called Chile. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll run it over for you. Uh-huh. Uh, boys. Please, 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 please. These boys are two native Cubans, Frank. They, uh... <laughs> they, uh... They give me the authentic rumba background, you see. Say, uh, this little guy's face looks very familiar. The little one, yes. He used to do Xavier Cougar's laundry, the little man. <laughs> Is the uh, big one a celebrity, too? The big one, the tall one, uh, yes, he is. He brought the first enchilado over to Staten Island, this big fella. Have you got your maracas, boys? Sí, maracas, maracas. maracas. Uh, they've got their maracas, Frank. Well, let's go, amigos. Chili! Chili! Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, Just a minute, boy. Uh, yes, uh, yes, Frank. What kind of a song is this? It only has one word. Well, yes, chili, one word is the verse, you see. The chorus comes later. Uh-huh. Be patient, Frank. It comes out all right. I'll guarantee you. All right, boys. <laughs> chili. I met a filly, they call Millie, what a dilly, was a filly dressed so lily white and filly with a skin just like vanilla, and it's the same with Chili down in Chili. 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 <laughs> well, Frank, you heard that applause. Is this song hit parade bait or not? You know, I think I like that song better when it was called the Peanut Vendor, Fred. I get it. You don't want to sing my song, eh? No, sir, Fred. I'd rather do something I know. For instance? Well, I'd like to sing She's Funny that way. All right, and I'd like to hear it, Frank. Nothing to see, just glad I'm living and lucky to be. I got a woman crazy for me. She's funny that way. I can't save a dollar, and I ain't worth a cent. She'd never holler, she'd live in a tent. I got a woman crazy for me. She's funny that way. So I know she'd work and slave for me every day. Better off if I went away. But why should I leave her? Why should I go? She'd be unhappy without me, I know. I got a woman that's crazy for me. She's funny that way. When I hurt her feelings once in a while, her only answer is one little smile. I got a woman. Crazy for me. 
she's funny that way. Excellent. Thank you very much, Frank. You know, it's a small world, Frankie, but if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't be standing here in a spotlight tonight getting this applause. Mm hmm. You mean you were responsible for well, my success? In a roundabout way, Frank. You see, you are the Jitterbug's idol, and I started the whole Jitterbug movement. You know, to look at me, you wouldn't believe that I was the first Jitterbug. No, I wouldn't. How did it happen? <laughs> well, I mean, you wouldn't now, but I mean, look back a few years. <laughs> How did it happen? I'll tell you. Syncopation ran in our family, Frank. When I was two days old, I crept out of my crib and crawled down a gopher hole. My father said, Hey, come up out of that gopher hole, son. And I said, Dig me, Daddy, dig me. <laughs> you see, when I was two days old, they dug me. For the next 17 years, I slept in the attic. I was on the beam. When I was 19... <laughs> When I was 19, I decided to go to New York. I ordered a suit from a, a Mr. Zeiss, a little Dutch tailor in town. And the day I called for the suit, when it was finished, Mr. Zeiss said... Yeah, yeah. Everything is ready now. Try it on, huh? Well, I put the suit on. The thing was a mess. I said, Mr. Zeiss, yeah, yeah. look at this suit. The pants are all baggy at the knees, and the cuffs are choking my ankles. The coat comes down to my shins, and the lapels are hanging down on my hips. You call this a suit? Uh, I am too sorry. I am breaking my glasses, and I am making the suit for memory. But it's too... It's too big. I'm baggy all over. Oh, my eyes are too bad. Ain't you a tall, fat man? No, no, I'm short and thin. Oh, Himmel, I am memorizing the wrong man. Well, what about... What about this suit? Well, the suit suits you. Take it. When the suit suits you, it's a suit suit. <laughs> With my suit suit, I left for New York. I got a job as a waiter in a flop house cafeteria. One day, the manager caught me lapping the butter off some waffles. The manager said, We've had enough of your hot licks, Alan. You're through. Uh, <laughs> then I got a job as a subway guard. One day, I was packing people into the Bronx Express. The vice president of the RIT said, You're jamming these people in too tight. This is your last jam session, Alan. You're fired. <laughs> Then I got a job putting the names up on a movie theater marquee. One morning, I put up Mickey Rooney's name and left the M out of Mickey. The theater manager said, Mickey Rooney, I'll lick you, Alan Tramp. The day after the theater manager called me a Mickey, I got my draft notice, Frank. After I uh, had my physical, the head of the draft board said, Alan, we tapped your knee. Uh -huh. The joint's jumping. Yes, sir. <laughs> we, uh, we tapped your head. Brother, you're solid. Solid. That makes me a jitterbug, sir. Am I in? Yes, Alan. This draft board doesn't know much about jive, but we can certainly send you. Ah. Well, that's my story, Frank Sinatra. I was the first dicky, the first one to hold a jam session, the first one to have somebody dig me. I was solid. I had the first suit suit. I was the original jitterbug. And today, when the jitterbug craze is finally sweeping the country, Frank, here I am with only an A card. I can't even go to town. <laughs> Before we close the Texaco Star Theater, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank Frank Sinatra for dropping in tonight. Next week, our guest will be the new literary light, the author of that new book, So Help Me, George E. Jessel. And now, Jimmy, if you'd like to sum up for the defense... For the defense of your car against excessive warm weather wear, give it a Texaco Spring Tonics now. Thermomark back chassis lubrication, a crankcase refilled with Texaco's famous insulated Haviland motor oil, and a stem to stern checkup by your neighborhood Texaco dealer. A Texaco Spring Tonic gives aging cars a new lease on life. Thank you, Jimmy. This is Fred Allen speaking for Texaco dealers from coast to coast, inviting you to tune in again next Sunday and to drive in at any time. Remember, you're welcome. Good night. Thank you. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.